Folks, as soon as we get a green light up here on the podium, we'll start and we have a green light. So let's get started. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the meeting of the Edina City Council. It is Tuesday evening, April 16, 2024, uh, 7.03 p.m. And uh, as Director Benarat indicated, we're doing these meetings in a hybrid fashion. We have been ever since the start of COVID. People can listen in from home live and they can contact us uh, we provide that opportunity for a community comment and a public hearing if we have one. Tonight we only have community comment as an opportunity for people to call in. We also have uh, residents in the audience that may wish to uh, address the council on a matter of concern to them uh, in community comment. So folks may be watching on cable TV or at edinamn.gov live meetings or at facebook.com edinamn. And they're certainly welcome to participate in the meeting. We're gonna put the um, the phone number up on the screen right now because the uh, community comment comes up fairly quickly. So those are the numbers that you need to have in mind when you call in, so if you can write them down quickly at home. Um, those are the numbers to call in to access an operator, and then the operator will bring in to Director Benarat. Director Benarat will bring in front of the council if you're calling in as part of community comment. And just a reminder, uh, when we get to community comment, uh, you can you can express any kind of concern you want to the council as long as it's not about something that's otherwise on the agenda this evening or scheduled for a future public hearing. So having provided that information, let's uh, call the meeting to order and I'm gonna ask our clerk, Sharon Allison, to call the roll. Clerk Allison. Councilmember Agnew. Here. Councilmember Jackson. Here. Councilmember Pierce. Here. Councilmember Risser. Here. Mayor Huffman. Here. Uh, next, folks, is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks, everyone. And um, we've got a form of meeting agenda that's been published uh, to the residents in our community. And uh, is there anyone on the council or from a staff standpoint that wishes to modify the meeting agenda in any form or fashion? All right, is there a motion to adopt the meeting agenda as published? So moved. Second. Member Jackson moves, Member Agnew seconds the adoption of the meeting agenda as published. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the meeting agenda as published, say aye. 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 Opposed, carried. The meeting agenda is adopted. Uh, next, we are now back at community comment. So um, folks at home, you should be thinking about getting ready to call in or call in if you desire to talk to the council about something of concern to you. But first, I'm gonna turn to uh, any of our fellow residents in the audience that wish to address the council on a matter of concern to them. Again, you'll have three minutes. You'll get a yellow warning light when you got about 30 seconds to wrap up and that way we treat everybody the same. And uh, then when the red light goes on, if you can be wrapping up your comments, that'd be helpful. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor, council members, my name is Harry McClanahan and I live at 7200 York. My wife Gloria and I have owned our home for 22 years, so when it comes to Edina's well-being, we've had skin in the game for a long time. I'm not here because I'm upset about anything you or the city staff have done, but to share two ideas about city government intended to help you make the most responsible decisions possible. Both points concern your dual roles as council and HRA members and both apply to currently volatile challenging topics like affordable housing. However, my hope is that you'll find my suggestions rele relevant regardless of the issue. My first suggestion, my first ask, is that the next time you're faced with a tough call and searching for a decision-making tiebreaker, remind yourselves whom you represent and equally important, whom you do not. As you know, our government is not a democracy. It's a republic, a representative democracy and you represent Edina's residents. You do not represent state, county, regional, read Met Council, nor, and this one's hard to overemphasize, aspiring 
Edina residents. Ideally and oftentimes those constituencies need uh, needs align with ours. However, if or when they don't, our residents' policy interests always trump theirs. I realize there's more to consider when you're making tough calls, but the principle that your foremost responsibility is to current Edina residents is a red line you shouldn't cross. Significantly, try as they may, the legislature can't change this. As I speak, the majority is trying to remove you from affordable housing decision making, and they might be successful. However, when the current session's dust settles, and it will, whatever local control capital you've retained still belongs to us, Edina's residents, exclusively period, full stop. My second suggestion, my second ask, is to be sure you prioritize the interests of the residents of the city at large whenever you're making policy. Edina does not have a ward system. Edina has an at-large system. So you've been elected to represent all of us, not particular neighborhoods or small areas. Again, ideally, the interests of every neighborhood and small area will align on every issue, but if or when they don't, your primary responsibility is to represent the interests of the residents of the city at large. Finally, both suggestions apply equally to city staff. Different roles, of course. Same accountability, absolutely. I know it's all really simple stuff except when it's not. Thanks for listening and good luck. Thank you, Mr. McClanahan. Anyone else in the audience who wishes to address the council on a matter of concern to them? Good evening, um, Janie Weston, 6136 Brookview Avenue. I have lots of trees on my property and I'm very good at tree identification. Um, I have some comments about our tree ordinance as it stands now. I realize there's a uh, Better Together Edina comment period on how it's written right now. Um, I've looked at the tree ordinance, read it over multiple times, and I see that contrary to what we have, or I have seen in previous meetings, um, the tree ordinance is not limited to just residential properties. It says that it includes subdivisions. The only exception is parkland. That specifically is spelled out. Um, I have heard, told at previous meetings that it does not include commercial property. Uh, that is not how it is written. Commercial property is not excluded. It doesn't say anything about that being excluded. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. I know that will be further discussion soon. Um, another point. I just had to have a tree that had just died removed that a previous owner had planted directly under the power lines, plus two more trimmed off that had been um, well, one planted under the power lines too. The um, XL authorized tree trimmer came and took them down, but there is nothing in our tree ordinance that addresses what to do if you have a tree removed um, in relation to power line trimming. I think that would be helpful I know because of past experience, you're supposed to call um, XL Energy, but not everybody knows this. I think that would be something good to at least have one or two sentences addressing that in there. Um, also, if it's a heritage tree, now termed heritage tree, is the homeowner obligated to replace a whole tree if the XL Energy people decide it needs to 
completely be taken down. Don't know. I, I don't have any ideas on this. This is something to be discussed. And also, um, how uh, homeowners should, or property owners, commercial property owners, doesn't matter who they are, how diseased trees are to be handled. There needs to be some guidance in here because we have not just emerald ash borer being a problem, we have oak wilt, we have the three-line chestnut borer going after oak trees. Um, oak wilt is a fungal disease. I'm very concerned about my two big heritage oaks that dominate my front yard. Um, there needs to be some sort of guidance in what to do if you suspect that you may have some disease. Should you call the city forester? Should you call a tree company? Something, um, something for homeowners and property owners to have as a guidance and how to, re how to address these. And if you are obligated to do a replacement, if disease or insects take a tree on your property. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weston. Anyone else in the audience wish to address the council on a matter of concern to them? Okay, let's turn to Director Benarod, see if we've got anybody standing by in the virtual world that wants to visit with us. I have no one standing online in the virtual world to visit with us tonight. Right. Very good. Uh, our practice is uh, that we will uh, respond to these uh, concerns of residents at the subsequent uh, city council meeting and is our as is our practice, our city manager will respond uh, to those community comments made at that prior meeting and I'll turn now to manager Scott Neal to respond to community comments made at our April 2nd meeting. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, there was one community comment made at the April 2nd uh, meeting and that comment was regarding uh, uh, when does the city or what are the plans the city has to upgrade the lights and improvements at Lewis Park? Uh, Lewis Park Shelter is, is on our capital improvement plan uh, for, for improvements replacements in 2025, so next year. Uh, ath athletic uh, field lighting requirements uh, are also part of that CIP as well. So that's the response for that question. Um, back, you may remember back on March 19th, so the meeting prior to April 2nd, uh, I received a, a note uh, from Ralph Zickert pr just immediately prior to the meeting, and he asked me to read a statement. Uh, I did not read it that night because I wasn't uh, sure exactly what was happening, um, but I'll read it tonight, uh, just word for word. And it says, yes, period, uh, city staff has determined that Mr. Zickert's analysis was correct. Over 80% of commercial customers are still paying less for water in 2024 than they did in 2022. And that's all I have for you. Does that prompt anything from council members? Very good. Thanks, Manager Neal. Um, all right, the next matter on the agenda is the uh, consent agenda. We've got numerous items on the consent agenda. Member Risser would like to remove item 6E. Uh, is there any other council member that would like to remove an item from the consent agenda? Is there a motion to adopt the items on the consent agenda with the exception of item 6E? So moved. Second. Where Jackson moves, <coughs> member Pierce seconds the adoption of the items on the consent agenda in a single motion with the exception of item 6E. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the motion stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Let's go back now to 6E, which deals with a request for purchase, and it is for 2024 asphalt and concrete recycling. Member Risser. Um, sometimes I think that the titles of items uh, can be a little bit misleading. And I thought that was the case with this because, you know, you see request for purchase. And I um, thought it would be nice if we could have staff um, provide a little bit more information because this is not just spending money. So um, that's why I asked for it to be pulled. Director Milner, are you going to? Yeah, I can speak to that one? measure. Yeah, I can um, too. Or you can, you can both. <laughs> old pine on it if you want. So every year we collect all the materials when we have water main breaks or other issues in the streets where we have uh, old pavement that needs to come up and we stockpile it at our cold storage facility and then every year or two when that pile gets so big we bring in a firm to grind it all up and we reuse it. So we recycle that material to backfill 
excavations then later on. So it's really a giant recycling program of taking the old streets, bringing it over, crushing it, making it appropriate, and then reusing it in, in various uh, locations as needed. It's a very loud and disruptive couple of weeks yes. when this happens, but it takes a, an enormous pile of broken concrete stuff and puts it into a pile that looks more like gravel and fill. And we use it again. We use it again. Yeah, good. Member Risher. So there is a financial benefit to this? Yes. I don't know that we've ever taken the time to characterize, you know, it costs us 62000 to do this. Do we save 50000 uh, I don't think we've done that, but we could. Uh, that wouldn't be too too difficult to do. Member Risser, would you care to move the approval of the request for purchase for 2024 for asphalt and concrete recycling? So moved. A second. And a motion by Member Risser, a second by Member Agnew to adopt uh, uh, the request for purchase for 2024 for asphalt and concrete recycling with uh, Intex for the sum of $62,700. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the motion stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. All right, that completes our work and that portion of the agenda. We now go to special recognitions and presentations. And, uh, you know, this was uh, oh, a month or so ago, Manager Neal and I were talking about on the, on the heels of uh, the uh, high school girls winning the state hockey tournament, the boys winning the state hockey tournament. Uh, we started thinking about all of the teams that had uh, had won championships uh, this past year. And so we got a hold of uh, the superintendent and the athletic director, and we said, we got to start getting teams in here uh, every couple of weeks, and hopefully we can get everybody here that's won a state championship before the school year ends. So we're doing our best, and uh, lo and behold, the first uh, group here, uh, Coach and I were talking earlier, uh, you were here at, right when the city uh, hall opened you guys weren't even born yet uh and um and one of those uh, teams won the state championship as well so here we're here tonight to recognize the adina high school boys swimming and diving team and i'm just going to read the names i know you're not all here uh, but at least you'll get your names read we're going to take a photo and then we've got a small gift for you that director benarat put together uh alexander uh, alaco uh, Rohan D'Souza Larson, Edward Fry, Patrick Gabler, George Geprich, John Geprich, John Hamburger, uh, Mark Jacoby Krohn, Stephen Canty Mahanti, Kingston Cavati, Kingston I met earlier, uh, uh, Talon McFarland, Leo Mellum, William Thurk, uh, Jerry Shway, and Jiwan Shway. So those are the uh, folks from the uh, Dinah High School Boys Swimming and Diving Team that won the state championship. Let's give them a big round of applause. Honored and pleased to be recognized by the Edina City Council. Thank you, Mayor Hovland. 
Uh, as he mentioned, we were here, we were the first Edina High School team honored here as such as a state champion 20 years ago, probably to the date. We were the first team that was in the new facility. And we've been honored several times since then. And the last few years due to COVID, uh, we, we have not had those recognitions. So we're very pleased and honored to uh, not only be here, but to, uh, we, uh, we, we like to um, represent Edina in a positive fashion. Uh, when we go to places, uh, coaches and athletes, they look at our team in a positive light. And we're very honored to uh, to continue to do that tradition. So thank you very much. Thanks for joining us tonight. You don't have to hang around, as Director Benarod said. Uh, you're welcome to if you, if you so desire. Uh, we've got some other things in this portion of the agenda, some proclamations we're going to read uh, uh, in, a, in a moment. But next we're going to go. This was one you might want to stick around for, everybody. <laughs> this is the Dinah Crime Prevention Fund Firefighter of the Year. And it is Alley 80. And this is, uh, this is a person you should know. And hear about because uh, our chief uh, Andrew Slam is going to talk about her, and she is really a terrific addition to our our uh, fire department, our public safety personnel, our first responders. You know how important they are to everybody. So, Chief, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and members of council. Thanks for making everyone stay for this. We appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, Alley 80. The Edina Crime Prevention has supported the police department as a community partner, and, and they've recently begun supporting the Edina Fire Department as well. The Firefighter of the Year Award is a, another newly created award that will be presented annually to a firefighter who has modeled exemplary service, leadership, and dedication to serving the citizens of Edina. The first recipient of this award is Alley. Allie joined the fire department in 2020, in March of 2020, if you all recall that time uh, in being hired. Since being hired, Allie has led by example on what, what it means to be practiced and prepared as a firefighter. Her partners noted she spent the first year of her career at, the Edina, at Edina studying during most of the downtime instead of relaxing as, called it, calls, uh, as time allowed. Allie takes advantage of training within and outside of the fire department as a student and an instructor. While instructing training, Allie takes notes of who's in attendance and will ensure the topics are covered, which are possibly completely new to an individual or someone who is struggling. If Allie is aware of a fellow firefighter that will be attending an upcoming skills class, she takes the time to familiarize the firefighter with the basics of the topic so they have an understanding of what's being covered and it isn't foreign to them. Allie is always willing to put her fellow firefighters' needs above her own. It's evident in the way she promotes family-oriented traditions at the fire department. She has gone above and beyond in planning the fire department family Christmas party that brings together firefighters, spouses, children, and even extended family members. In the first year of planning and coordinating this event, Allie spent her own money to ensure the event went smoothly and that families had a good time asking for nothing in return. Most notably, Allie consistently remains positive and upbeat as a partner, even through difficult patients, onslaughts of calls, or an emotionally taxing call. Allie was described by one of her partners as the voice of encouragement and having extreme motivation and dedication. Allie is the first one to volunteer to help with any task and the last one to leave, ensuring that the work has been completed, almost certainly going above and beyond to do so. Allie's favorite line when someone gives her a compliment or tries to recognize her for a job well done is, uh, it's a team sport. Allie, is re Allie recognizes that this job would be incredibly difficult without great partners, but Allie defines what it means to be a great partner. This is apparent when Allie received four nominations for Firefighter of the Year from her peers. One of the, her nominations read that the city, this department, and our colleagues are much better having Allie as part of our team. Allie's unwavering positivity and determination through any incident, her selfless acts for her partners and community, alongside her unmatched dedication to this department are all why she is deserving and has been awarded the 2023 Firefighter of the Year.
So Mayor Hublin and members of the council, Ali loves public speaking and has prepared a, a couple of notes here before the picture opportunity. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor and council members. Being nominated for Firefighter of the Year is an incredible honor, but it doesn't compare to the honor I feel every day serving this amazing community alongside of my peers in the fire and police department. Um, author John Maxwell once wrote, nothing of significance was ever achieved by an individual acting alone. Look below the surface and you will find that all seemingly solo acts are really team efforts. This award um, belongs to me as much as it does to my incredible shift and department. And I wouldn't be here without the support and encouragement of everyone. So thank you all. All right, you guys, thanks for sticking around. Appreciate that. <laughs> Class dismissed. You could stick around for the Small Business Week proclamation if you want. <laughs> and thanks to all the firefighters and police officers for being here too, all of our first responders. Appreciate you being here. All right, um, again, in this part of the agenda, we've got some other things uh, to take care of, including proclamations, uh, the first one of which is uh, Small Business Week in the Edina, designating April 28th through May 4th, 2024, as Small Business Week in the City of Edina. And the proclamation reads as follows: We've got a few folks here, few folks here, to accept the proclamation and talk a little, little bit about Small Business Week. Uh, the proclamation, as I said, reads as follows: There are more than 2,400 businesses located in the City of Edina. And according to the United States Census, over 96% of all firms with paid employees in Hennepin County have fewer than 100 employees and are classified as small businesses. And whereas small, business, small businesses are located in each of Edina's commercial districts, including 44th in France, 50th in France, 70th in Cahill, Cahill Business Industrial Park, Grandview, Lincoln Drive, Southdale, and Greater Southdale, Pentagon Park, Washington Avenue, and Wooddale Valley View. And whereas according to the United States Small Business Administration, small businesses account for two thirds of the nation's employment growth. And whereas 79% of consumers surveyed in the 2021 Consumer Insights Survey understand the importance of supporting small businesses located in a community. And whereas the city of Edina celebrates our local small businesses and recognizes the vital contributions these businesses make to the local economy and to the overall health and vibrancy of Edina. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Edina does hereby proclaim April 28th through May 4th, 2024 as Small Business Week in the City of Edina and urges the residents and guests of our community to support small businesses and merchants located in each of Edina's commercial districts and throughout the year. Uh, is there a motion to adopt the proclamation? So moved. Second. And a motion by Member Jackson, second by Member Pierce to adopt the Small Business Week proclamation designating April 28th to May 4th, 2024 as Small Business Week in the City of Edina. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of, of the proclamation as read, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Proclamations adopted. And this evening we have uh, some distinguished guests with us. We've got Shelley Loberg from the Edina Chamber of Commerce. And we have Annette Wildenauer from the Edina Innovation Lab uh, here to accept the proclamation. I thought that, oh, and uh, Rebecca Sorensen from the 50th and France Business Association is here as well. I'm going to walk this proclamation down. I think each of them have a few words to say. So 
Um, Shelly, you might be up first. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having us tonight. Um, I want to just let you know that the chamber exists to promote and connect the business community here in Edina. And I personally see every month, especially like at our networking breakfast, we call it our Sunrise Edina Business Breakfast, that uh, small business owners are making intimate connections with, with people. They're learning about each other's businesses, but they're also making connections that further other business and personal relationships. That fills my heart a lot every month. Um, and so it's from small events like that to large things like the Edina a fall into the arts festival where we have the opportunity to showcase all of the amazing small businesses in Edina. Thank you so much for having us tonight. Thanks, Shelly. Good evening. I'm Annette Wildenauer and I run the Edina Innovation Lab. We offer executive education to entrepreneurs and I have the privilege of working with many of those businesses for a six month period in helping them grow their business. It is so exciting to see small businesses thrive and grow. They are the backbone of our economy and it is a privilege to work with them here in Edina. Thank you very much, Rebecca Sorensen. So thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me on behalf of the 150 businesses at 50th in France. We're honored to be here celebrating Small Business Week. Before I stepped into this new role as your director of 50th in France, I got to know many of our small businesses as a community volunteer. I learned firsthand it is always the small businesses that step up and support our community and celebrate every stage of life with us, from first dates to anniversaries, weddings to baby showers, family events to biking with friends for ice cream. They really are the lifeblood of our community. In honor of Small Business Week, I would like to offer up a challenge to all of us here in Edina. Let's put our phones away. Let's close the laptops. Let's stroll, bike, or enjoy one of the 1,000 parking spots at 50th and France. Check out my Instagram video to learn more. Invite your friends to catch a movie at our crown jewel, the Edina Theater. Hot tip Tuesdays, it's $5 movie night. Dine at one of our award-winning restaurants and go into a business. Cancel the Amazon cart. Find a merchant. Let them help you pick out a gift and wrap it in a bow. Not only are these in-person experiences at 50th and France supporting our local economy, but we have learned from the popular Netflix series by Dan Buettner, whose son Danny is a new Edina resident, that these in-person community experiences are good for our longevity. So let's do that. Let's be together. Let's shop local. Let's dine local. And I'll see you at 50th and France. Thanks. Our next proclamation has to deal with Earth Day in Edina. I just did a Mayor's Minute uh, before our work session on Earth Day and what's upcoming in the Edina community. And I see a few of our longtime environmentalists out here in the, in the audience. I may even ask them to come up and say something. But the Earth Day proclamation uh, reads as follows. Earth Day in Edina, April 22nd, 2024. Whereas Earth Day is commemorated annually on April 22nd to demonstrate support for environmental protection, advance sustainability initiatives, and raise awareness about climate change. And whereas the city of Edina is committed to addressing climate change and has taken steps to reduce its carbon footprint, 
conserve natural resources and foster environmental stewardship. And whereas the, uh, in 2021, the City of Edina adopted a climate action plan, which lays the foundation for those who live and work in Edina to imagine a future where the earth and all who live on it can thrive. This plan outlines our commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 45% by 2030 and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. It includes integrating sustainability into our programs, policies, and activities. And whereas Edina residents and businesses have demonstrated a commitment to environmental sustainability through various initiatives, such as adopting renewable energy, participating in the organics recycling program, and supporting local conservation efforts. And whereas Earth Day serves as a reminder of our responsibility to the Earth and to future generations to leave a livable world. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Edina does hereby proclaim April 22nd, 2024 as Earth Day in Edina and encourages all residents and businesses to recognize the importance of protecting our environment and combating climate change, participate in local Earth Day events and initiatives aimed at environmental education and action, commit to making sustainable choices that reduce our impact on the planet, and support programs that su uh, promote clean energy conservation and a healthy, sustainable future. Is there a motion to adopt the proclamation as read? So moved. Second. Member Jackson moves. Member Agnew seconds the adoption of the proclamation designating April 22nd, 2024 as Earth Day in Edina. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting uh, the proclamation as read say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And our uh, engineering director, uh, Chad Milner, is here to accept the proclamation. But I'm going to ask uh, Paul Thompson, I know this is a bit of a surprise to him, to come up and talk about what's going on in Weber Park this weekend. I think as, as we get uh, done with Director Milner, you can come up. Director Milner. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. We really appreciate the commitment that the Council has to environmental sustainability as stated in this proclamation. I just wanted the public residents to know that there's a lot of programs out there right now to take advantage of. From the city standpoint, we have a climate action fund that'll help with matching funds to do solar panels or HVAC improvements on your property. You can call and get home energy audits paid for through this fund at your individual homes. And then there's many, many state and federal programs, tax credits and rebates associated with cars or transportation and your homes. Uh, E-bikes, solar, PV, HVAC systems. So really look out there and take advantage of all the programs that are out there right now. So thank you again, Mayor and members of Council. All right, thank you, Director Milner. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, <clears throat> we have an Electrify Everything um, meeting coming up for the residents. What date is that? Is it May 14th? Is that correct? I'd have to look at the calendar. It's yeah. the May 15th at the Public Works and Park Maintenance May 15th. Facility. So it's a little after Earth Day, yeah. but everybody come, come to Public and, Works yep. on May 15th and, and learn how to electrify your home. Exactly, thank Good you. Good promo, right. thank yeah, you. Thanks. Thank you, Member Jackson. All right, uh, our, our resident, uh, longtime resident, Paul Thompson. Uh, I talked a little bit about what's happening this weekend, but I think you, your voice will be important on this matter. So, Yeah, I just want to, I, I didn't prepare anything, so I'm just here to say thank you for, I mean, it's way back to 2007 when the Project Earth High School students challenged Mayor Hovland, actually council member at that time? No, mayor. Mayor, then mayor, yeah. yeah. Uh, to start a, uh, an energy commission, and that led to all the things that have happened. So it's been, you know, a long, long, almost 20 years now since we've been working on this goal, and Earth Day belongs to all of us, right? It's not an Earth Day. It's every day is Earth Day. And besides what Chad has shared, we're also having a tree planting at Centennial Parks on the 26th. Uh, we're having the clothing swap on uh, Thursday, May 9th. That is an incredibly powerful event. Last year, I think there were almost two tons of clothing brought in and taken away without any money exchanged. So it's really that lifestyle of learning to, to live, uh, you know, with reusing and taking care of the resources in our home, in our community. So our Morningside Neighborhood Association uh, has been planning uh, an Earth Day event for this Sunday. The weather is going to pass. It's going to be chilly in the morning, but it'll be a wonderful afternoon, 58 degrees. Mayor Hovland and Heather Adelson, our state rep, will be giving words of welcome. The teardowns, the great uh, Morningside rock band is going to be playing sets. We have an orchestra uh, quartet from the high school. 
uh, face painting, all kinds of things. The, ki- the, the neighbor said, make it fun, Paul. It's got to be fun to get the people coming out and participating. So it's going to be four hours of music, food, fun, and then learning about whatever the next steps are for each individual family. So come to Weber Park and uh, hear our mayor. Right, and I think our, um, our recycling coordinator will be there too, or our, our composting I think Twyla, Twyla, will, be Twyla will be there, and yep. that's the good news. I asked Twyla, our goal was to get Orningside up to 50% in uh, organics collection. She said, you're already there. So now our new goal is 75%, and to get the city up to 50%, because yep. 80 tons a month is what we're collecting. That's a huge, huge savings in energy and in uh, greenhouse gases. So keep it up. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yep. Thanks for Happy being Earth here. Happy Earth Week. Nice to have you here, and, and Mindy as well. Thank you. All right, uh, we've got a related uh, proclamation that's coming up uh, right after the uh, Earth Day proclamation, and it is Arbor Day proclamation uh, designating Arbor Day as April 26, 2024, and our city forester, Luther Overholt, is here to accept the proclamation. The proclamation reads as follows. Uh, in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas this holiday called Arbor Day was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska. Anybody believe that? A million trees in Nebraska. Uh, they must all be in the northeast corner. Um, and whereas forest soils preventing, uh, prevent flooding and reduce stormwater by capturing and storing rainwater and snowmelt which is then slowly released to our lakes, streams, and groundwater. And whereas trees and forests improve our physical health by cleaning the air, reducing exposure to the sun's UV rays, and decreasing temperatures during the summertime. And whereas one tree provides $62,000 worth of pollution control over a period of 50 years. And whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce life-giving oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife. And whereas forests create high-quality drinking water by acting as a natural filter, and whereas Edina is proud of the beautiful shade trees which grace our homes and public places, now therefore the City Council of the City of Edina is hereby proclaim April 26, 2024 as Arbor Day in the City of Edina and calls upon the spirited and foresighted citizens of Edina to plant trees now for our pleasure and that of future generations. Is there a motion to adopt the proclamation as read? So moved. Second. Member Jackson moves. Member Pierce seconds the adoption of the proclamation on Arbor Day as read, designating uh, April 26, 2024 as Arbor Day in Edina. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the proclamation as read say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Carried. Uh, proclamation is adopted. As I said, we've got Luther Overholt, our forester, with us. You know, uh, we decided during uh, COVID we're going to plant a thousand trees on public property. We're going to get an update from Luther on how that's going. Uh, I think he's got a goal of doing another 500 this year. And then you're probably going to have a tree sale again for for, uh, private uh, parties that wish to put uh, trees on their uh, on, on their own residential lots. So we'll hear a little bit more about that from you. Thanks for being here, Luther. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, yes, that is all uh, correct. So with the uh, uh, ARPA funds uh, over 2022 and 2023, we planted over 1,000 new trees in the city uh, with those funds. Uh, on the city website, I have an interactive map on there that shows where each of those have been planted throughout the city. Um, uh, right now, uh, I have a tree sale going on for residents as well. We have 600 trees available uh, this spring. They'll be picked up on Mother's Day weekend, and then we'll have another 400 trees available for this fall, so kind of splitting it a bit with spring and fall planting. Um, and uh, we have about uh, 18 different varieties of trees for the spring sale. Uh, they're all 10-gallon potted trees that are normally 100 to $200, and uh, we're subsidizing the cost, so they're all $50 a piece for residents. Um, just to you know, kind of help help with that. Um, there is also this year an option to have the tree contract planted for you as well. Uh, my partner in this is Tree Trust, and so they're uh, able to do that and have been working with residents uh, to help them plan uh, the planting so that uh, you know they kind of take all the, the work out of it for you because some people aren't able to do it um, or don't want to do it. Um, but uh, the main reason I'm here is Arbor Day. I'd like to invite uh, mayor, council, everyone watching, listening to our annual Arbor Day event. 
It's the last Friday in April, April 26th. This year it'll be at Centennial Lakes Park. Uh, we'll be kicking off around noon and going until four o'clock. Uh, we'll be planting around 90 new trees at Centennial Lakes. Um, many of you may know Centennial Lakes already has a lot of trees and so the majority of the trees we will be doing will be along uh, the promenade which is still considered a part of Centennial. And so maybe, you know, not in the, the park proper there but it'll be uh, along the adjacent walking trails and paths uh, throughout the promenade. Um, we'll have uh, music, the high school marching band will be there to provide music. Um, the Edina Art Center is helping out with an uh, art cart, so some activities for kids will be doing um, kind of uh, tree cookie prints. So, you know, take the slice of the tree, put ink and paint on there, and then, you know, put it down on paper for, you know, for, for children. Um, there'll be free tree seedlings available. And then Edina Liquor will have beer and wine sampling as well, uh, right by the Hughes Pavilion. Um, and so just kind of trying to grow the event every year and, uh, you know, looking forward to it as always. Uh, thank you very much. All right, can you tell us how somebody would go about uh, ordering a tree? To, you know, you got 600 of them. How do they sign up or how do they purchase a tree this spring? Yep, so if you go on the, uh, the quickest, easiest way, if you go on the city website, uh, put in tree sale in the search bar in the top right-hand corner, uh, it'll come up uh, with a link. The link brings you to Tree Trust's website. They're the host. Uh, you do have to log in and create an account because everything is done online now. They, uh, you know, take your credit card information. If, uh, if you have any difficulties with that, there is a number on the bottom of the page. You can call them and um, they're more than happy to help uh, get, every, get people registered as well um, and, and do it over the phone. Um, there's, uh, yeah, like I said, I think 18 different uh, tree uh, varieties available. We're, we're sold out of a couple now, so maybe it's closer to 15 now. Um, but we'll have, uh, you know, some, some different ones available again in the fall. Uh, I've kind of have it divided up as a, like a, a fruit tree section, a uh, large shade tree section, and then kind of a smaller tree section for under power lines, just uh, you know, a bunch of different options, and, and then a uh, conifer section as well for some, some pines and spruce and, and other coniferous trees uh, for kind of more of that uh, you know, natural fence or you know, other, other options like that. Very good. Other questions for Mr. Overholt? All right. Well, thanks for being here, and um, here's that proclamation if you want to... Thank you. All right, we've got two other proclamations this evening to um, to read and adopt. And uh, one is with regard to something called Days of Remembrance that we've been doing since this first came about, uh, probably 13 years ago or so, on a national basis. And I'll read the proclamation. We got, we've got Jim Nelson, who's a Human Rights and Relations Commission member uh, here as a commissioner to accept the proclamation. The proclamation uh, designates May 6, 2024 as the day of Days of Remembrance uh, event day. Uh, and that's usually an event we have right here at the City Hall. And I'll let uh, Commissioner Nelson talk about that a little bit when he comes up to accept the proclamation. And the proclamation reads as follows. Whereas the Holocaust was the state-sponsored systematic persecution, annihilation, and genocide of six million Jews, and millions of other Holocaust victims by Nazi Germany and its collaborators between 1933 and 1945, with 17 million people murdered. And whereas the history of the Holocaust offers an opportunity to reflect on the moral responsibilities of individuals, societies, and governments, and whereas we, the people of the city of Edina, should always remember the terrible events of the Holocaust and remain vigilant against hatred, persecution, genocide, and tyranny, and whereas despite the lessons of history, acts of genocide are to this day being perpetrated in many parts of the world and horrific crimes motivated by bias are being committed in this country. And whereas we, the people of the city of Edina, should actively rededicate ourselves to the principles of individual freedom in a just society. And whereas the days of remembrance are set aside annually occurring in April or May to coincide with the national celebration of Yom HaShoah for the people of the city of Edina to remember the victims of the Holocaust as well as to reflect on the need for respect of all peoples and continuing vigilance against bias and genocidal acts. And whereas pursuant to the act of Congress, the United States Holocaust Memorial Council designates annually the days of remembrance of the victims of the Holocaust, including the days of remembrance known as Yom HaShoah. Now therefore be it resolved that the City Council of City Dinah does hereby recognize and continue to promote days of remembrance in memory of the victims of the Holocaust and in honor of the survivors as well as the rescuers and liberators and further proclaim that we, as citizens of the city of Edina, 
will work to promote human dignity and confront hate whenever and wherever it occurs. Is there a motion to adopt the Days of Remembrance Proclamation? So moved. Second. Member Jackson moves. Member Agnew seconds the adoption of the Days of Remembrance Proclamation uh, as read. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the resolution or the proclamation say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. The proclamation is adopted. I'm going to walk down and hand it to Commissioner Nelson, and he has a few remarks, I believe. <laughs> looking for his car coaster. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of the City Council. This proclamation is the continuation, as the Mayor said, of the City's observance of the Holocaust Days of Remembrance, which actually began back in 2011 in Edina. The HRC has recommended uh, some minor changes included in this revised proclamation to modernize some of the terms used. Um, in the original proclamations and to expand the proclamation to include the recognition of the sad fact that genocide continues throughout many parts of the world. This year our Days of Remembrance event will be held on May 16th at uh, 7 p.m. in these chambers where Dr. Ellen Kennedy, a nationally and internationally recognized expert on genocide, will discuss three gen genocides that have historically occurred in Ukraine. The first being Stalin's genocide by intentional starvation in the 30s. The second, of course, being the genocide of Ukrainian Jews by the Nazis. And the third being the current attack on Ukrainian sovereignty by Putin's Russia. We invite all city council members and all members of our community and surrounding communities to join us on that evening for this enlightening discussion. Thank you again to the city of Edina for its steadfast support of the efforts of the Edina HRC. Thank you very, very much. Good. Thank you, Commissioner Nelson. Uh, Director Benner, did you want a photo of this? Sure. If I don't get All a, right. if I don't get a car yeah, coaster, I might as well take the photo. Hard for you to get a car coaster. I'll get you a car coaster. No. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be fun. And the last matter in this uh, portion of the agenda is um, the proclamation involving Building Safety Month. And um, Nate Borwage, our chief building official, is here to accept the proclamation. And uh, the proclamation reads as follows. Uh, building Safety Month, May 2024. Whereas our city of Edina is committed to recognizing that our growth and strength depends on the safety and essential role of our homes, building, and infrastructure play, both in everyday life and in times of natural disaster. And whereas our confidence in the structural integrity of these buildings that make up our community is achieved through the devotion of vigilant guardians, such as building safety and fire prevention officials and others in the construction industry who work year-round to ensure the safe construction of buildings. And whereas these guardians are dedicated members of the International Code Council that are experts in the built environment to create and implement the highest quality codes to protect us, protect us in the buildings where we live, learn, work, play. And whereas these modern building codes include safeguards to protect the public from natural disasters, such as hurricanes, snowstorms, tornadoes, wildland fires, floods, and earthquakes. And whereas Building Safety Month is sponsored by the International Code Council to remind the public about the critical role of our community's largely unknown protectors of public safety, our local code officials, who assure us of safe, sustainable, and affordable buildings that are essential to our prosperity. And whereas Mission Possible, the theme of Building Safety Month 2024, encourages us all to raise awareness about building safety on a personal, local, and global scale. And whereas each year in observance of Building Safety Month, people all over the world are asked to consider the commitment to improving building safety 
and to acknowledge the essential service provided to all of us by local and state building departments, fire prevention bureaus, and federal agencies in protecting lives and property. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Edina does hereby proclaim the month of May 2024 as Building Safety Month in the City of Edina. Accordingly, I encourage our citizens to join with their communities in participation in Building Safety Month. Is there a motion to adopt the Building Safety Month proclamation? So moved. Second. Member Jackson moves. Member Agnew seconds the adoption of the Building Safety Month proclamation as read. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the uh, Building uh, Safety Month proclamation say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, thanks for being with us this evening. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, City Council members. But I'm Nate Borwich, the Chief Building Official for the City of Edina. Our Building Inspections Department team consists of 15 employees. We provide the services to the community that safeguard life, health, property, and public welfare by regulating and controlling the design, alteration, construction, materials, use, and occupancy of buildings and homes in Edina. In 2023, we conducted just over 20,500 inspections within the city. Our department is a proud member of the International Code Council, and we will work to promote, to promote public awareness of the role building safety and fire prevention officials play to protect lives and structures. I would like to thank you all for your support and for supporting our building inspections department and ask for your continued support in Building Safety Month during May. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Borridge. I've yes. got to do one more thing I forgot to do. All those in favor of adopting the proclamation say aye. 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 Opposed? Gary, here, I have this for you, sir. All right, that concludes that portion of the agenda. As mentioned earlier by Director Benarat, in the public hearing portion of the agenda, uh, we just have a, a matter there that we're going to continue to May 7. So is there a motion to continue the public hearing to May 7, 2024 uh, on the uh, request for preliminary rezoning and site plan variances and subdivision for 6600-6800 uh, France Avenue South? So moved. Second. Member Jackson moves. Member Pierce seconds the uh, continuation of the public hearing uh, on resolution 2024-24 uh, involving the preliminary rezoning and site plan variances and subdivision requests for 6600 to 6800 France Avenue uh, to May 7, 2024. Any further discussion? All those in favor of continuing this matter to May 7, 2024? Um, I do uh, have a question, little comment. Go discussion. Ahead. Um, discussion. And this has to do with our process. And um, because this particular public hearing has been moved two times, um, I did dig into the Minnesota statute about public hearings and I reached out to the League of Minnesota Cities to find out if you are moving a public hearing, do you need to then go through the notification process that involves um, printing information about the public hearing in the local papers? And um, the researcher at League of Minnesota City said, yes, you do, but um, apparently our protocol here in Edina is not to do that. And I guess I would like more clarification from our attorney or the city manager about that. And you know, I wanna ask other council members if maybe we wanna change that policy. Uh, Manager Neal or Mr. Kendall? Sure, I can, I can start and then uh, Mr. Kendall can fill in as well. This, the practice that we use to, is to continue a public hearing to a new date is, is pretty typical compared to, compared to our peer city, compared to all cities actually. Um, we, uh, as long as that continuance uh, is granted by the council in a public council meeting. Um, we, we do understand, I had a chance to look at the, the, the response that uh, council member Risser got from from the research associate at the at the league as well, and and we can move toward that uh, that process. It might it might be better in some ways, but our current process meets the the uh, compliance uh, of state statute. And I can let Mr. Kendall talk about that. Thank you, Mr. Kendall. Uh, Mayor Council, that that is correct. The statute allows as long as you note the date, time, location of the next continued meeting on the record when you do continue it, 
the statute allows for that. I think that's what most cities in Minnesota do. Of course, you're, you have the option to do more than is legally required, but you are meeting current legal requirements. We talked in our work session today about having a, a session soon on a, on a number of different issues. I wonder if this would be a good one to talk about within the context of that I, potpourri of ideas that we had uh, for discussion. Member Risser. I think we really should take a look at this, um, particularly because it, it got me thinking that really there's no um, motivation for a developer if you, you know, you're concerned about public pushback or what, to move it to a different date. Um, it doesn't seem to be the case that there would be any kind of motivation not to do that. Um, the other the other thing is um, you could say, well, those who are following this will know because they'll show up and then it won't happen and they'll have to come back. And in this case, um, I think word got out so that people are not here. But a significant number of people got up and left when they found out that this hearing was not happening at our April 2nd meeting. Uh, the developers do notify residents nearby with mailings, but it, I think it's very possible you could have somebody who gets a notice uh, who goes, oh, I'm going to be out of town, I can't do this, or I can't, you know, I can't make it, I've got work. And um, so if you had a new notice that said it was a different date, you might actually be able to show up. So I, I think there's situations where this um, really could make a difference in whether or not somebody decides to participate. So yes, let's talk about this at a meeting where we're discussing other things. Good, thank you for that. Anybody else have a comment? All right. All those in favor of continuing this matter to May 7, 2024, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, now we're on the reports and recommendations portion of the agenda. And the first matter there is a resolution 2024-29 accepting uh, donations. And uh, is there a motion to adopt resolution 2024-29? So moved. Second. Jackson moves and Ragnar seconds the adoption of resolution 2024-29 which accepts donations on behalf of the city of Edina. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the, of the resolution 2024-29 say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And um, motions approved, uh, resolutions adopted. And in this reporting period, uh, the Edina Crime Prevention Fund has uh, donated a um, little over $1,800 in challenge coins to the uh, police department and then also uh, took care of some certificate frames. So uh, thank you to again, as always, to the Edina Crime Prevention Fund for the ongoing support for our first responders in both the police and fire departments. Um, next matter is, uh, this portion of the agenda is the consideration of a conservation easement and purchase of vacant land at 5235 Highwood Drive. And I think Director Teague has this matter. I don't know if you had any preliminary comments, uh, Manager Neal. I, I do have some just introductory. No, but Manager Neal has nothing. I, I don't. We're going to. All right, we're going to go right to, to Director Teague. Teague. Yep. All right, good. Yeah, this okay. is. I think folks will find this pretty interesting. So, yes, thank, thank you, you, Mayor, members of the council. So Andy Carter, on behalf of some of his neighbors, are requesting that the council consider the purchase of the vacant land that's located at 5235 Highwood Drive. It's about a 19,000 square foot piece of property that's vacant. There's a lot of very mature oak trees um, that, that fills the site. Mr. Carter has purchased that property last year. Um, again, it's a vacant single family residential lot where a single family home could be built. Mr. Carter hopes to add a piece of that property to his lot. He, his, his lot is to the south of this property. The property owner to the west would also add a portion of this lot to their lot to make it quite a bit larger. And the result is the parcel C that's included on the survey in your packet. And uh, part of Mr. Carter's presentation will show that. The remaining parcel is about 9,000 square feet. The, so the request again is for the city to purchase that property um, at an amount of $150,000. That's the value of the raw land itself and then put a conservation easement over that property. The neighbors would then pay the city back through the, uh, the 429 assessment process. 
This is similar to the project the mayor may remember about three, four years ago that we did on Oak Lane. There was a, another single family um, vacant lot where a home could be built. In fact, the property owner at that time was proposing a home. The neighbors went together and um, purchased that price, pur purchased the lot. Again, the city purchased it with the reimbursement through that 429 process. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Carter to present their, present their case. All right. Thanks, Gary. Um, Mayor, Council, City Leadership, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks for having us. Um, I thought the, uh, the proclamations for Earth Day and Arbor Day were, were very appropriate and powerful. Um, I think what could be even more powerful is taking action on those proclamations. Um, and there's an opportunity to do that right here. Uh, so, like Mr. Uh, Carter, would you give us your address too, please? Yes, yes. I'm at 6012 Pine Grove Road. I've got my neighbor Andy Bennett here, and then Leonard Blum as well back there. Um, I'm at 5229 Highwood Drive West. I've enjoyed working. Okay. How about this? Yeah, that'll be fine. Thanks, Mr. Thanks, yeah, Mr. I've Bennett. enjoyed the last number of months working with Mr. Milner and Mayor Hovland and. Mr. Neal and, and, and you too, Mr. Teague. So happy to be here tonight. So like Mr. Teague mentioned, I'm the property owner to the south that technically owns this 5235 Highwood. Mr. Bennett is to the west. Um, and before we kind of get into the presentation, I'd, I'd like to just ask Andy to kind of give the quick story of the previous owner of both the house and the land and kind of that's, where, well, that's really where this, this movement kind of started. Sure. I, I'm going to go back to uh, what Paul actually said earlier, because I was a longtime resident of Morningside for years and remember filling out a survey um, and talking about how we at the Morningside Neighborhood Association could improve our city canopy. That recommendation I made and lo and behold, this city and its effort hired Luther, not necessarily because of that comment, but it's an innovative group here. And um, my wife and young family moved from Morningside um, about a year ago and bought the home of Susie Hogland, who was the, uh, her husband Jean preceded her in death by about seven years, but she was a widow um, living in a, in a house um, that had this adjoining lot to it. She owned that as well. And we, uh, we wasn't in the Bennett budget to buy that vacant lot. Um, so the trustee put it up for sale after offering it to us. And the property, um, I think, Based on comments I received from neighbors, we talked to all the neighbors, they said, oh, Susie always envisioned this as just remaining undeveloped green space in urban forest. And so we liked that idea. And in fact, the trustee liked the notion of it, but uh, had fiduciary duties and put it, put it out to sale, it was put under contract by a housing, uh, by a builder, and uh, later fell out of contract by that builder after they realized that the property um, while a single family residential lot um, has some very technical and tough geotechnical aspects that would require um, some pretty significant variances due to the, the height and slope of the property and, um, and the setback requirements of the property and the surrounding uh, home. So through a long process, um, the, the price of the property got whittled down uh, to a price that we think was quite fair. and. My good neighbor here, Mr. Carter, um, took the opportunity to, to kind of secure it for all of us neighbors, uh, and including himself and perhaps the city. Nice, yeah, thanks, Andy. Uh, yeah, so really, Susie's wish of keeping this a green space along with the city's climate action plan, I think, really provides a win-win for both the neighborhood and the city here. So we'll go through some quick details. Um, so just so everybody's aware where this is, it's down Vernon, north on Blake and east uh, about a block just on the southern end of Mirror Lake, as you can see in the circle here. Um, and then before we start talking about the trees and some water, let's not forget about wildlife and biodiversity here, okay? So I do a lot with sustainability for, for my job. People often, right, forget about, you know, the animals who live here. So I took all these pictures within a week. It was right around that late March snowstorm. Um, so I, we've got a lot of stuff, a lot more stuff here, but just again, Let's think about this while we're talking about the trees, too. Okay, um, so real quick uh, map of this lot. So the lot is in dark green. The three different proposed parcels uh, are kind of bordered by that light green shade, and parcel C is what we're really getting after here. So Mr. Teague said, right, 
Our wish is for the city to purchase it. I, I like the word finance better because the city will recoup all of this $150,000 potentially right over uh, the next 15 years uh, in whole. Um, is there some opportunity cost loss there for utilization of that money? Possibly. Um, but I think it's well worth it to see exactly what we're getting here and how it applies to the Climate Action Plan. Um, so, again, I just wanted to point out a visual view of this. This is a, a, the lot in black there, full of mature oaks, uh, 20 to 25 in total, um, depending on how you grade their age, but it is a full canopy. Um, it is very, very mature, and I always come back to you, okay, is it cheaper to right, maintain something you already have or right, to start from the ground up with saplings and wait 100 years for it to look like this? I think let's just keep it the way it is, right? So again, to the right, I kind of highlighted in blue about an area of 60 or so acres um, that is really, really heavily forested in this area. And the little green circle, of course, is where this lot would be in between some already some property already owned by the city. Um, but really, I mean, it's centrally located in this primary canopy region of Southern Mirror Lake. So a very, very unique, uh, unique space in the city. Okay, so why does this make sense? Um, I'll hit on two portions of the climate action plan. Number one, water. Um, so the, the manner we split, we want to split the lots, right? Those three parcels I, I already outlined it's going to be very difficult to build a home on the property, right? Parcel C is about 0.22 acres. It's 48% of the 0.45 acre overall lot. So what does that bring us if no house is there, right? There's no additional roof, okay? So I'm reminded of two lots that just got bulldozed, every tree taken out on Olinger Boulevard, about a half mile south of this. They've got a dark roof, a dark driveway, no trees anymore. That's what we don't want, right? So no roof, no additional driveway, no impervious surfaces. Uh, that's called out in the Climate Action Plan. No removal of trees, right? So the trees are anchoring that hill. There's going to be no erosion. Um, and therefore, right, no extra fertilizers that a lawn might put into Mirror Lake um, or additional drainage from the construction, et cetera. Um, green space and trees, this is probably the bigger, the bigger area, right? So again, it's in the heart of one of the biggest urban canopies in Edina. Um, I already kind of touched on this point, maintaining existing, far more efficient than planning it, right? It's already there. You don't really have to do anything. Um, again, it's an established canopy that, you know, trees are not buildings, right? You cannot tear it down and put up a brand new building. You have to wait time, right? You cannot buy time. There's 100-year-old trees already there that collect much more carbon than a sapling would. Um, so, again, this is just letting the trees do their thing. Um, and then, again... I think this maintains the gap. So I think I put close here. There's a, a you know, the 20, 2024 to 2030 tree cover acreage gap that I calculated that's outlined in the climate action plan is about 237 acres. This would just prevent us from going backwards, right? So just let's maintain. Let's not go backwards and then have to replant, right? Let's just maintain. Uh, and then again, just in further detail, so here's another satellite picture of the lot. Um, you can see my house very, very close um, to the lot line. My house was built in 1928. That's kind of the plat uh, uh, that the city did back, I think, in the 50s or 60s. Um, at any rate, very, very wooded. Um, again, maintaining the existing canopy, there's no money spent on or new trees. Okay, We've talked actually in this city council meeting multiple times about new trees. Uh, there's a cost to some of that. This would not have a new tree cost. Um, again, keep maintaining that, that acreage gap, um, don't go backwards, right? Let's not allow deforestation here. Let's just keep it. Um, I already kind of touched on, you know, the majority of those trees in this picture are in the parcel C that we'd love the city to help finance. Um, and then carbon capture, which has already been mentioned in this meeting, um, and erosion, I mentioned that too. So again, this is kind of right data for you guys to take and think about, um, but that's that's kind of it. Um, and so, real, yes. real quickly, just going back to that aerial image, what it what it sort of belies is the true nature of this piece of land, which is it, it has a 32 foot rise from the the curb to the back of the property, and it's it doesn't plane out anywhere, and and it really is kind of one of the reasons why this home builder broke the contract and walked away from the deal. I think he realized ultimately it's just a not a buildable site or one that would require immense expense to figure out. 
Okay, and then just real quick, the neighborhood group participation, right, in the um, kind of financing or the paying back the city. Again, it's everybody really surrounding this lot. Um, we've got verbal commitments ready to be uh, written up formally, uh, but eight confirmed neighbors um, surrounding the property that, that are for this. Leonard's done a lot of work in uh, getting signatures for, um, you know, petition if that's necessary, but everybody's in agreement here that uh, lives around the property. Uh, so finally, uh, the ask, okay? We are asking the city, you know, not to outright buy, but to finance. So, ca you know, cash up front, yes, but recouping all of that cash over the next 15 years via the tax assessment. Um, and again, we've already got verbal commitments of each neighbor and their, you know, portion of that tax commitment, and that would be equally rationed over the, over the next 15 years onto their property taxes um, as a special assessment. assessment. Um, and then we're recommending the city put this parcel C in an environmental trust with, with a definite date. So that'll obviously, right, post seed any of us moving. It'll be there for, um, I don't want to say eternity, but uh, it'll be there in perpetuity uh, for the long-term future. So I think that's kind of my ask for you guys to think about your proclamations on Earth Day, on Arbor Day. Let's make something happen. Let's, let's do a long-term action here and actually make those proclamations mean something, okay? Um, and again, we're ready, we're ready to work with the city to finalize you know, legal language. City's already done this on Oak Lane. Previously, that template is already set up. We're ready to piggyback onto that um, and do it again. Anybody have questions for Mr. Carter or Mr. Bennett? Member Jackson, and I can provide a little context too. Yeah, uh, my only question is about the trust, um, and this is for Mr. Kendall. Does the trust ever expire, or is it in perpetuity? Uh, Mayor, Council, I would suggest we probably do a conservation easement. Conservation easement. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I haven't looked at the exact mechanism, but I'm sure it could be done. I think a conservation easement would be probably more appropriate than an environmental trust, but I could... I can work out the details on that. Okay, terrific, because we, I, this is a great idea. Thank you so much for coming forward, and I want to make sure that it lasts. Thank you. Um, Member Risser. I really uh, um, like the idea of finding a way to preserve all the trees and, um, you know, the nature on the site. I'm looking at the map, and this is so close to Fox Meadow Park, and I'm wondering, you know, if we as the city purchase this and, you know, keep it as a natural area, could there be a way for residents to access this space? Um, you know, a nice quiet place to get away. Would the community be okay with people going from the park over into this area? So, so us yeah. to comment on that? Yeah. yeah um, you can answer it, but I'll, I'll, I'll get my comment, too. Sure. You go ahead. No, I, okay. I, I mean, you know, like I said, the city owns quite a bit of, of forested property in this area. There's already a park there. I don't know if this, to me, would make sense for other residents to own. I know that's probably not of the wish of the neighbors, if you want a, a direct answer. I'm thinking more public access, not um, changing ownership. No, but here's why I don't think that that works like you might want to work, have it work in a park. Because if you go over there and look at the property, it's exactly as Mr. Bennett described, Mr. Carter described. Uh, and I've been over there probably half a dozen times to look at it from the beginning of this process. And it's, it's basically unbuildable, and it's got a real sharp increase in elevation. Uh, the only place you could probably put a driveway would have been right on the cul-de-sac and then try to work your way back in there. It would... I don't see where, other than maybe it was a hiking trail to get through there, back to that nature preserve above, uh, I'll call it a nature preserve above uh, yeah. Pine Grove, at the end of Pine Grove. It really, it doesn't, it, it, you couldn't use it like you'd use a park. Right, yeah, I'll just, I'll just I mean, it's landlocked, right, by every, everybody else's property, as you can see in, in this map. Um, so we've got Zalverals, yeah. then High Guards, Carters, Scotts, Bennetts. Um, so I don't know if it's an, it, would, it could ever be an access anywhere. So leave that slide up there. I think this sure. is really a good one. So when we did this years ago over on Oak Lane, I'm going to just, just use this as kind of an example. It's, a, it's, a, it's not entirely uh, apples to apples, but think about uh, this uh, cul-de-sac in the middle as being bigger 
and that was a lot that was an out lot and there was a driveway in like where it says highwood drive on oak lane you could work your way back into this lot that was right in the middle of a bunch of other houses that already existed and uh, it was a real natural area it had some water features in it hard to get back to and the neighbors all came and said the same thing that these folks are saying is that, uh, gee, we don't really want to see anything built there. And the, the guy who had it under contract was really cooperative, was a, another Edina resident, and, he, and we worked uh, to a point where we got that into, I think that was a conservation easement. Yeah. And, and so then the neighbors did the same thing there. They, they decided how they were going to get assessed. We did an agreement with the city on how they got specially assessed on the property. This is a little bit different because you're going to take a little piece of it. You who bought the Haugland house are going to take a little piece of it. And what's left, I think it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and that's why I encouraged the, the house right to the, to the east of this lot is uh, Jim Zavril. And then Mr. Bennett's house is the star to the, to the left of that vacant lot. And then Mr. Carter's up behind there. Um, I, I just think it's, it's a really great way to preserve uh, some really good nature and some beautiful trees and put it in a conservation easement and and you get to pay for it all over time and the city gets to help facilitate that conservation easement and originally i would tell you all that this when they first the the, the trustee is a, was a guy from saint paul gene hogland and his wife susie had no kids and so they left their entire estate to the uh, mayo foundation and you remember that gene hogland owned a lot of 50th in France. He owned the theater. He owned the condo. He built the condos on the corner. He owned that furniture store across the way that used to be Twin City Federal. I mean, he had all kinds of property down there. And at one time he had been the president of Opus. And um, so uh, it, quite in the state, but of course the trustee felt obligated uh, from a fiduciary standpoint to try to maximize the value of it. So the first time this property was listed, I think it was 650. Mm -hmm. And then it went to 450, but still, really, I think when they came to see, when that builder came to see you, they really couldn't build anything on it because they need so many variances uh, to get anything built. And then they walked away. So we got back to this, I'll call it the Oak Lane strategy, which is to create a, uh, uh, some kind of a, a conservation easement back here that really provides a lot of benefit i think not only to neighbors but just to our our community so I, I i would support it you know because i think it's it's from a taxpayer standpoint it's it's painless for for the rest of us i mean you guys are going to have to We're pay that one pay that 150. that's right and the city determined what that parcel was worth yes, and, you, and you agreed so correct. i i think if others have questions or comments member Agnew. thank you mr mayor so why not just buy it and split it the two of you yeah that's a good question i mean i think we want the conservation easement to go beyond us i mean if, if i move out in two years that piece of the lot potentially if we did that could be right all the trees could be ripped down a new house could go up there what what have you so i think we want to make sure that it again goes beyond our time in this neighborhood um you know i plan on living there for quite a long time, but you never know, right? So I think that, that would be my response to that is this would last, you know, is it a 99 year, is it just in perpetuity? Is it, it would, it would last far longer than we are probably gonna be living there. I would, I would agree with that and just add that um, there's a sense of stewardship here and the city does have these little gems of real estate around the city that make it Edina and a special place. And uh, to perpetuate that and to divide it up in a way that we think makes it virtually impossible to develop into the future um, is, is a, a sense of, gives us a sense of stewardship and um, something that's special working in conjunction with not only neighbors, but the city. Um, it, it's, a, it's a united thing that feels, feels good. And there's, you know, there's cash dynamics too <laughs> that, are, that are real, I think, for all of us. Thank you. Uh, then maybe a couple of questions. Um, I'm confused a little bit by the finances. So if you could walk me through what would be like the out of pocket for Edina and I'm sure over time we would get more into those details, but just help me understand the breakdown in the structure financially. 
the, the breakdown of the cost of the property is $150,000. That's what we that's what we would be financing, and we would be financing that through the special assessment vehicle. That we would ask them to all execute special assessment agreements. Uh, we're not particular about the formula for how they want to spread the cost around. As long, from our perspective, as long as it equals one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, there we'd go through all the same kind of special assessment chapter four twenty nine process that we do for. Uh, public road projects, so there'd be a public hearing and and we'd ask them to waive their rights to appeal and, and all of that sort of thing, but it's in addition to the it's just the staff time on top of the actual cost of the of the land. Okay, so over time the full 150,000 would be recuperated Correct. from so by the city. Here, here's a quick math, uh, I guess equation that I'm thinking about Kate. It's so let's so 150,000. Let's just for easy math say five neighbors are in on it for $30,000 a piece, right? Uh, we're gonna do it over 15 years, so each neighbor would basically pay another $2,000 per year for 15 years to get to that 30 um, over the next 15. That's the quick quick round math. Um, again, it would be probably different than that in reality, but that's how it would be It would be recouped. Thank you. The term 15 years is, is comparable to what are the same as what we would do for a special assessment road project. Okay, thank you. And then, as I understand, this lot would be divided into three, yep. with a portion of it going um, to parcel B, a portion of it going um, to the to house to the south, mm -hmm. um, and then it would be the conservation easement for par parcel C. Correct. And so for the 150000 is it just for parcel C, and then yes. is there portions that each of you are paying for the amount that would then be added to your lot. Yep, yep, exactly. So, so I mean, it's public knowledge, right? This lot was purchased for $300,000, um, which is about 20% below taxable value that you guys have, have placed on the entire lot. Uh, so parcel C, roughly half that $150,000. We would be paying additional property taxes on, right, the new lot lines that we've already gone over with, with Chad and Carrie. Um, so it would be represented that way as well, yes. Thank you. And my last question, I think, for now, uh, with the existing site as it is, you know, we've, I've heard that there isn't necessarily any buildable area without extreme variances, probably. Um, what would be feasible without variances on this site? As the property sits today, the full 19,000 square feet, they may be able to get a house in there that doesn't require vari the variances that may come into play is in regard to the steep slopes. We have a steep slope ordinance that says you can only disturb a certain percentage of those slopes. So <clears throat> that might be where the variances come in, but just given the large area, um, they may be able to locate without setback variances if with the parcel C, now the lot is only 9,000 square feet, <clears throat> and it would be it would not be buildable because it doesn't have adequate lot area. So if in the future the easements go away, they would still need a variance just to build because the lot has gotten smaller. Thank you. And I did think of one last question, so I'm going to sneak that in. Um, so as I understand it, then the conservation easement would only apply to parcel C and there could be additional building then that would happen and potentially impact the the tree canopy or the trees that we have within the pieces being added to parcel B and what I'll call parcel A is that correct yeah I think that's fair um, you can see the house to the south how close that is to the lot line with that shifting to the north they would have room to potentially put an addition there and the same with the parcel B. Thank you. Member Risher. I want to thank Member Agnew for her questions. And um, I'm confused by the statement that a 9,453 square foot parcel is not adequate for building a home on in terms of its size. I understand that there's issues with grading and all of that, but 
I mean, we have four townhomes going up on a parcel that's about 11,000 square feet just off of Valley View. So how, I, I guess it's hard to hear that and know what's happening in other parts of the city. So why is this not large enough to build on? Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, the minimum lot size in Edina is determined by the median lot area, lot width, and lot depth of all parcels within 500 feet. The parcels within that 500 foot area are quite large. In fact, this 19,000 square foot lot is one of the smaller lots within that 500 foot area. So they would not meet that median. So they would need variances for lot area. And, and yet we create very small lots that are significantly smaller than neighboring properties elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Prompt anything from anyone else? Okay. Um, so uh, to the questions that Member Agnew was asking about financing, uh, as I recall, there'd be interest paid. I mean, if we have to borrow the 150 or we pay, we use our funds to do the lending up front, we're going to get paid back at a, we're going we're to get interest on the money that we expend through the That's special right. assessment process. That would be our practice, yes. Yep. All right. So, um, let me look here. Can you just clarify that, Scott? When, when we do uh, a, a, a street project or a reconstruction project, uh, we have a practice of doing a, doing a debt issuance, using that money to actually finance the project. And we, we usually assess in our special assessments, is it one, one point over what we borrow or two? Yep, one, 1 right? percent over what we borrow, and it's yeah. typically been in that 3 to 4 percent for the last 10, 12 years. Just right. So if we have to go out and borrow it at 2 percent, you'd pay 3 or 4 or whatever. And you would borrow it? Well, that's a good question. We, we haven't determined yeah. that yet, right? It, whether it's an internal finance or an external borrowing. Uh, something of a hundred and fifty thousand dollars is almost for sure we would do that internally. Okay. That wouldn't mean we wouldn't charge interest. Yeah, no, understood. I just wanted a clarification yeah. on that. I think no. I think the Oak Lane property didn't charge interest is why I was curious. All right. So, um, what kind of direction are you looking for here? Is whether or not we'd be interested in. Providing the financing? Yes, because for, there's uh, a parcel C. There's a lot of process here if you if you think about the special assessment project. So if there's a you can't approve this tonight because there's not enough information in front of right. you to approve, but you can give us a signal that you'd like us to go through the the four twenty nine process and set the public hearings in motion and all of that. That gives you that gives you a position later down the line to approve or not approve this formally. And you want that in the form of a motion? Yeah. Okay. Uh, member Risser, I think a member Jackson maybe had a question too. I just want to, if, I mean, as individuals, you could create this, um, set it aside. <laughs> you wouldn't need the city to do that, but then you would be paying for it. But if there's enough interest among Neighbors, I mean, maybe there'd be interest in not having the city be involved at all. I, I, if I could answer your question, and come on up and come up to the front here, so we can get you on screen and sure. and uh, give us your name and address, please. Hi, I'm Leonard Blum. I'm at uh, 5240 Highwood Drive, and I represent the uh, the neighbors. Uh, in addition to Andy and Andy who are hoping to participate in this project, but who do not have an interest in acquiring land. Um, we would like to commit financially to see this, uh, this land preserved um, and, uh, and recognize, I think, for some of us, the trade-off between 
the desire for uh, environmental protection and affordable housing, which is so needed in Edina. Um, but we, we came together to support this initiative uh, because we felt that affordable housing wasn't an option here for a variety of reasons I, uh, I could go into if you're interested but don't want to take your time. And so in the interest of really preserving, focusing on preserving the environment, we determined that we would rather purchase the land and give it to the city as opposed to purchase it on behalf of our neighbors with whom we have good relations. But for the same reason that, that Andy said, we have more confidence that, that the city will preserve this property in, in perpetuity, uh, both the flora and fauna that have you know, historically occupied it. So your question, I think, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Did I adequately? I, yeah, and, and I'm just thinking there's nonprofits out there that do this kind of work as well. I, th I think that you can set up, you know, land trusts in perpetuity with, I'm not, I'm drawing a blank, but I seem to remember there are such things that exist. We, we considered that option originally, um, but when we heard about the precedent uh, at Oak Bend? Oak Lane. Oak Lane. We thought that that essentially accomplished what we would intend to do if we were to purchase the land and then donate it to a conservation easement. Um, so recognizing that the city would, would manage that for us, we felt that was a more efficient approach. Projection? I'd like to make the motion that we uh, set in, in, into motion um, the process to set up a conservation easement um, according to the plans laid out by the neighbors. And so I will move that. A second. All right, it's been moved and seconded that we uh, initiate the 429 process to uh, create a financing situation or look at creating a financing situation and a, and a prospective conservation easement with respect to parcel C um, that's shown on the survey involving 5235 Highwood Drive. Uh, further discussion? Yes, Member Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to confirm this is a, a non-binding direction to the city to pursue it, but we would still be going through all of the process and would be able to vote one way or another That's down correct. the road. That's right. Thank you. Uh, further comment? Moving forward, we would also get some sort of understanding of what um, financial commitment this would be, you know, to maintain this area of wooded space. Other, other thoughts? Okay, we've got a motion. I just, well, if I may. Yes. I, I just want to say thank you again. And this is, this is one of the things that I love about the city is neighbors coming together and coming up with a solution and in line with our values. So thank you very much for all the work you've done to this point. All right, we've got a motion and a second. And um, others can make comments if they desire after we vote. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the motion as uh, stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And others wish to comment? All right. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here this evening. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Mr. Blum as well. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, now we're going back to Mr. Milner. And we we're picking up on a matter that we uh, laid over until tonight with respect to the Concord neighborhood. Concord was called the Concord B and C Neighborhood Roadway Reconstruction Project. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Yes, we are back to get a final answer on sidewalks and there's some question on the fire code. So we have Chief Slamma with us this evening to answer some of the questions. I just want to remind the council, this was the petition. We addressed three uh, items at the last council meeting. You gave me direction and we're working on the direction you've given us. 2B, we also had a discussion on that, so we're just looking at item 2A with relation to the sidewalk. Um, and then there were some emails and questions related to the fire code review, so I think Chief Slama should uh, speak to that now. 
based on some of the conversations you've been seeing and having through the emails. Uh, thank yeah, you, thank Mayor you. and members of the council. Um, talking, getting caught up to speed on this with Chief, or Chad Milner and our fire marshal, there's some confusion that took place regarding fire apparatus access roads and the interpretation of fire code. Um, what I'm here to talk about tonight is the authority for that being with the fire department. The fire, to, fire code official shall have the authority to require or permit modifications to the required access widths. Uh, we dove into the commentary around the, the code required with apparatus access and uh, that commentary is fire departments respond to many types of emergency situations and the dur jurisdictions that they serve may have traffic safety criteria that impact the design and access of roadways used by emergency response vehicles. The section authorizes the fire code official to require greater or to allow lesser access width dimensions based on their size and maneuverability of the anticipated emergency response apparatus, including mutual aid apparatus from neighboring communities or agencies. So as the fire department reviews this, uh, this design, uh, we have no issues with the current street design as far as apparatus access or operations for fire, for fire department operations with a structure fire emergency incident. Uh, I think the question at hand is, where should the sidewalk be placed and will the fire department utilize the sidewalk for fire department operations? The answer to that is this would be the only road that we would use this in. Uh, and it would require us to have a specific training set for one area of the community. So I am not recommending that we use the sidewalk uh, as an extension to the fire apparatus access road, that the current design and clear space uh, is suitable for fire department operations. And uh, as we look at this sidewalk design, I'd encourage the council to also consider the, the pedestrian safety with traffic flow there. And so I would recommend a, a buffer or a notification. I know uh, Mr. Milner talked about uh, having that, that buffer or notification and the design that they have for that. I can't speak to that completely, but I would recommend uh, that the sidewalk consider pedestrian safety and that's what we've considered in this review. So. Um, the current design of the street, the fire department supports and our operations can sustain for single family homes at which they'd be protecting. And we'd recommend uh, safety be considered for that sidewalk, including whatever buffer or warning is recommended through sidewalk design. We would not utilize that for fire department operations. We apologize for some of the communications that went out between uh, members of our departments when we were gone or other officials were gone. And that's where this confusion came from. This is our standard street width we've done for nearly 20 years and it's been in, in, uh, documented in that living streets plan from 2015 where many departments were part of developing that policy with the guidance the chief just mentioned, including the fire department at the time. So uh, from an engineering standpoint, we would recommend that five foot sidewalk with a five foot boulevard. Again, that increases that public safety separating from the vehicles it allows that room for snow storage, both for city operations and for the residents to have some space to, to do the snow, unless we decide otherwise later this year. Uh, it helps stormwater management, the permitting related to stormwater, and then the industry standards. That's the industry standard is create that buffer between the street and the sidewalk. So we would recommend the five foot sidewalk and five foot boulevard. And You're recommending happy. the five plus the five. Exactly, Mayor. As opposed to the five plus one that we talked about last. That's a lesser. Meeting. Uh, facility in our opinion both operationally safety of the traveling public and all the other reasons we discussed council members questions for uh, director Milner or for our fire chief Better. member Risser. okay just um, to be crystal clear um, we have a situation where with parking my understanding is we do not have a 20 foot wide space if cars were along the street. Is that correct? Yes, yep, if it's shown here, we have 16 feet of clear space, but again, parking is temporary, not a permanent situation, like we talked about at the previous meetings. Right. There's a whole different design standards when we have permanent parking, and this is not the case per city code in this instance. Okay, and it's just, I'm as a council person, and I, I do really wanna give a shout out to Mr., I think it was, McClanahan, who at the very beginning stated that we really, our role is to represent re residents. And I know residents have really spent a lot of time working on this. Um, 
And so respectfully, I just wanna make sure that I am completely understanding this because I understand that parking is temporary. However, I think the concern is if there are cars parked and there is a fire and you don't have 20 feet, is it possible you would have to use that sidewalk that would be aligned with the street without a boulevard. And that was the narrative, and that was my understanding that um, Deputy State Fire Marshal Tom Jensen was responding to, uh, but he did make it very clear that local fire officials, you know, would take precedence. And I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that we're all talking about the exact same thing. Uh, Council Member Rister, I can take that question and uh, try to provide an interpretation for that. So uh, you are correct, the, the Deputy State Fire Marshal, Mr. Tom Jensen, uh, did comment on this and he gave exactly the code requirements, uh, which talks about the apparatus access code requirements. He did also provide the interpretation that the local fire code official weighs in on this and provides the actual code interpretation as it's not black and white like the, the fire code says. Each project is reviewed independently and, uh, and commented on the, on the fire department. Evaluating public safety and operations and balancing those with the project. And so um, the current design is the current design does meet the operational needs for single family homes uh, with all of the apparatus that we have in the fire department. Okay. And I'll offer there was an email from the fire marshal, but that was different streets. That was Wooddale. That was only 15 feet wide and 64th Street and engineering department made those changes based on the fire marshal's comment not to use the sidewalk in those regards. So that was changed in December. Those were, so that email with that comment about using the sidewalk was a whole different streets within this neighborhood. It didn't have to do with Concord Avenue. Thank you. Member Pierce. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. So thanks for the explanation, uh, but can we, can we really try to make this plain? Um, and so I appreciate the code and you talking about the apparatus, all of that. And I do appreciate that, <laughs> but it gets confusing. Um, and so with this design, if there is a fire call that we need to service and there's a car parked in the parking lane, are we concerned, are there concerns that we're gonna be able to provide services for the residents? And then how would we do that today? Council Member Pierce, uh, I have no concerns with the current design for our apparatus placement or setup, even with the parking lane full of vehicles. Uh, there's many variables despite any emergency. Uh, the specific concern with the code interpretation here is making sure the fire department has enough room to set up operations uh, with our apparatus fully deployed to get 360 degree use of the ladder, which again, if we're talking about one house fire, we're working off of one side. Um, we have enough space to set up with the clear space of those drive lanes. Uh, it could be interpreted that there could be an accident that would prevent us. We work around those variables but with the current design, it actually increases the space when compared to what's there today. Okay, thank you. Other questions? So one of the issues that came up at our last meeting was um, this whole conversation around some of the neighbors thinking five plus five was good, some thinking five plus one with the strip was better with the aggregate strip. Uh, but sort of the, one of the overriding questions was, well, if you go five by five, five and five, does it affect uh, any of the trees? Because you talked about the fact that the way you align the road, you're only gonna have to take out one tree uh, on that street. And it wasn't in that great a shape anyway, as I, as I recall. And uh, if we go five foot sidewalk and five foot boulevard, does that affect the number of trees that we, you would have to take out to accomplish this project? None additional. It's a foot narrower than we had on the bid documents. So we had 11 feet, we had eight and three in the original plans that were bid out with our contractor. We're now a foot less. And then again, we got some adjustments next to retaining, two retaining walls along the property. So there's gonna be some instances where there's no boulevard, but most of the street, it'll be five and five. And no additional impacts to trees along this corridor. Another question I got uh, by voicemail yesterday was, uh, 
Are we doing anything down on 64th Street with respect to approving this project that involves sidewalks on the frontage road running parallel to the crosstown? Yes. Are we, you coming, are we coming back to talk about that? No, that's been approved by City Council in December. Okay. All right. So the sidewalks are going in down there on 64th. There's a portion where there's room to have safe operations for fire where we can still create the space needed and have a sidewalk that's off the street. And then there's another two blocks where we can't create that space that we're just going to create on a big wide concrete gutter that's all one level that they can operate within there. So, so that's the direction we got from the fire marshal in November, early December. We made those changes and you approved that in December. All right. Thanks for that. I'll pass that information along. That prompt anything else from anyone on the council? Okay. Um, so the uh, motion that you've uh, advanced for us to consider is uh, whether to approve a sidewalk along the west side of Concord Avenue from Valley View Road to 64th Street as a five foot wide sidewalk with a five foot wide boulevard. Is that correct? Correct. All right. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Mr. Pierce moves. I second. Discussion? Discussion? All those in favor of the motion as stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. I abstain. You abstain? I abstain. All right. Thank you. Thank All right. You. One abstention. Four ayes. Thanks. So for those in the audience that were wondering, well, why was Member Jackson abstaining? She was, there was an original proposal that there be a, what's called a single use uh, or shared use pathway. Shared use pathway that was eight feet wide, 10 feet wide, eight feet wide. in lieu of a sidewalk. And, and we determined last meeting we weren't going to do that. But Member Jackson has strong feelings and strong talks about it and feelings. Both. Um, all right. And so now we are down to uh, the um, what's occupying a little bit of time at the legislature, just coincidentally with what we're doing here at the city of Edina. And this is with respect to uh, the potential adoption of an ordinance involving accessory dwelling units. And uh, Mr. Lewis, our community development coordinator, is back to uh, visit with the council about this. We um, we had a discussion about it two weeks ago. We held the matter open for additional public testimony. We took public testimony that night, and now we're here to make a decision on this uh, on this proposed ordinance from the Planning Commission. I think that came up to us unanimously from the Planning Commission. And I think in your prior, prior presentation, maybe you're gonna show us this again, when you did the, the survey amongst the residents in our, in our town, about 70% of the people that responded liked this idea of an accessory dwelling unit, either within the house attached to the house or detached from the house or on top of a garage. So uh, I'll go ahead and let you make your presentation. Sure, um, thank you, Mayor. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, as you mentioned, at the previous meeting, staff and members of the Planning Commission presented the proposed ADU ordinance um, and the in-person public hearing was held. Tonight, the action requested is a motion to approve first reading of ordinance number 2024-02 regarding accessory dwelling units. Um, if there are no changes to the ordinance, uh, council may waive second reading. Uh, Planning Commission did recommend unanimous approval of the ordinance with the deletion of provision 36439-2G, which states accessory dwelling units shall be constructed on a frost protected foundation. Uh, staff is comfortable with that deletion um, since frost protection is addressed in the building code. I did just want to touch on a, on a couple other things um, from the last meeting. So um, at the last meeting, we spent a lot of time talking about what is in the proposed ADU ordinance, but maybe not enough time talking about um, how existing regulations will impact the development of ADU. So one of the things I wanted to talk to, about tonight is our building coverage re requirement, uh, which limits the percentage of a parcel that can be occupied by principal and accessory buildings. Um, so for lots 9,000 square feet or more, that limitation is 25% of the lot. For lots uh, less than 9,000 square feet, that limit is 30%, but not more than 2,250 square feet. 
Um, so it's important to note that this ADU ordinance does not uh, allow you to cover any more of your property with a building than is currently allowed today. Um, so even though the maximum size allowed for an ADU may be 1,000 square feet, um, that's simply not going to be possible for a lot of, of properties. So I want to just run through a couple of quick examples. Um, so the image on the right is a uh, parcel uh, in Edina that's pretty typical. So the lot size is about 9,620 square feet. Since it's over 9,000 square feet, the, the lot coverage is 25%. Um, so they could cover uh, a maximum of 2,405 square feet with uh, principal accessory buildings. Um, if, we, if the existing coverage is 1,769 square feet, then that would leave, leave them with a maximum of 636 square feet for either an attached uh, ADU or a detached ADU. So um, in this case, this property owner would not be able to build up to the maximum 1,000 square feet. Um, here's just another example. This lot is 7,007 square feet, so um, would allow for a maximum building coverage of 30%. Um, if the existing coverage is 2,080 2, square feet, that would leave them just 22 square feet of building coverage left. So not enough to uh, construct a new uh, detached accessory building. Um, so in that case, property owners might look to construct uh, an ADU above the garage since that wouldn't add any additional building coverage. Um, in this case, it looks like that wouldn't be possible since um, with adding the second story, um, there's an additional setback requirement. So um, in, in this example, this, this property owner would need to, um, if they wanted to add a new detached ADU or an addition onto the property, um, some additional existing building would need to be removed, but they could still look at, at an internal ADU in the basement, so they would still have that option. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. Building coverage is probably um, one of the things in the zoning ordinance that um, will probably be one of the bigger constraints in the zoning ordinance, I'll say. Um, you know, some, some other things that property owners will have to uh, think about and deal with. Um, when thinking about an ADU for the property is the tree ordinance. We've talked about, you know, that's really effective at getting people to think about removing trees. Um, there's also, you know, an impervious surface requirement that applies to every lot, setbacks. Um, the placement of the existing dwelling may limit where a property owner could place an ADU. Um, and then there's also a total 1,000 square foot limit for all detached accessory buildings. So if you already had, say, a, a 500 square foot shed, then if you wanted to build a, a separate detached ADU, the most you could do would be another 500 square feet. So um, just wanted to kind of touch on that a little bit, um, but at this point I'll turn it back to council for a discussion. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Mr. Lewis. Uh, Member Pierce. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. So I just first, uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Lewis and um, Commissioner Smith and Chair uh, Jimmy Bennett, um, I spent uh, some time with them last week to go through this, um, as well as I met with a, a couple of neighbors. Um, and I do believe that this is good for Edina. Um, and there are a couple of things that we talked about two weeks ago, um, I think three reasons uh, for families that may have an adult special needs child that they want to do an a build an ADU for um, was one. Uh, people wanting to kind of age in place was a second. Um, and I think you might have mentioned uh, a um, um, adult child coming back home. I don't know if you mentioned that one, but that's what's going on in our house. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> and so I do think that those, those reasons um, are, are Definitely valid reasons, so I appreciate you bringing this forward. Um, I do think that the concern I, I raised two weeks ago about um, mitigating the imposition to the neighbor, um, I still think that is a very valid point. Uh, but, uh, so thanks for the last two slides that you went through. We actually did that in some more detail. I actually sent a couple of addresses and uh, Mr. Lewis went through the coverage, the setbacks. Um, and so I got really comfortable with the, uh, what you already have in the ordinance. I think that that will definitely govern the proliferation of ADUs. I, I think that will limit it. Um, 
and the way we presented it two weeks ago, I definitely can see, and this came up with one of the neighbors I met with, the, the um, thousand square foot max. And so I asked about that. I was like, that's, that's I mean, that, that could be a pretty big ADU. So here, look at this address, look at that address and tell me what does that mean? Um, and we looked at it, um, you showed the one example. Um, and so I do feel pretty confident that when we communicate um, how this is gonna live, we definitely have to do a good job of helping people understand, even though that might be the max, what's actually possible, right? Um, and so I do believe that after I talk to the neighbors, as I mentioned, I still think this issue of, of how do we mitigate uh, a potential imposition for the neighbor, like that's a serious, um, that's a serious concern that we need to think about. <clears throat> and I'm gonna put it in a different context um, than what I originally thought I would, would uh, mention. Um, as we look at the, um, the state had a missing middle bill. And then the intent behind that bill, while very noble, I definitely support it, trying to solve that challenge of affordable housing. But one of the ways that it is trying to accomplish that actually does take uh, some of the, the uh, control away from local was the intent, part of the intent behind it. Um, and so as I kind of read through that and I thought about this, um, what this ordinance is doing um, is that we have, and we, and I think this is, I think we do this in a lot of our zoning policies where we focus on eliminating or articulating challenges for the owner who's trying to accomplish something. And so this is kind of geared towards that. But in a lot of cases, we actually then don't provide ways for the neighbor to mitigate a potential imposition should they choose to. Um, and so the example I'll give is I mentioned doing screening um, two weeks ago. If a neighbor wants to put up an eight foot privacy fence, they actually can't do that. They'd have to have a variance for that because the, the max is six feet. Um, and so when I think about that, it would make sense to me that if a neighbor is, if their neighbor is building an ADU and the adjacent neighbor wants to put up screening, they could do a vegetation wall, right? Of, and I don't know if there's a limit on that. Maybe there's a physical <laughs> limit on that. But they could do a vegetation wall. Uh, but they'd have to apply, they would have to apply for a variance to do a, a taller privacy fence. And my understanding is today, they probably wouldn't meet the, the requirements uh, to be able to do that. Um, and you don't need to speak to that. I'm really just trying to tee this up um, that I think not only in this case, but as we go forward and we really start to lean into building codes and zoning and the state does what the state is trying to do, from a local government perspective, we got to really be thinking about how, what changes do we need to make in order to make sure that we're, we're making policy and building code decisions that's representative of everybody in Edina. And it's not just focused, um, and I shouldn't say only focused on the owner, but predominantly focused on something that an owner uh, of a property might be trying to do because the neighbor who is, feels an imposition Right, they're a property owner too. And so we should be able to provide um, some methods that that owner, should they want to mitigate a potential imposition, they have some options. Um, and today I think those options are, are limited. Um, the other thing that we did, you've talked about the, um, the coverage limits. So I, I, I think you did a great job of talking through that. Um, the other thing that we did is we looked at, at data. Um, and I know you guys had already done this, but you just shared the data that you looked at. Um, so we, we looked at surrounding areas and surrounding communities and the 
implementation of ADUs was in the, the low single digits um, for the surrounding, um, our surrounding communities. And that actually was a good thing, um, the way I viewed it, because I think it might actually, it might be an indication that if we have the limitations set right, that then the folks who really need this would be the ones that actually do it. So I think it will help govern uh, the prolif proliferation of ADUs. And my hope would be that those who really need it end up being the, the owners that apply for it. Um, and so I, I found that to be um, encouraging. And so regarding the imposition, there's, a, there's three things that I think we should consider doing, and none of these impact the current ordinance. This is all um, additional work that we would do. Uh, one, I kind of mentioned, I, I think we, we should look at the screening, and if a owner, um, if their neighbor is, is doing building an, a detached ADU, um, we should have a process that might allow them to apply for a variance where they could um, get an approval for an eight foot uh, privacy fence. Uh, and so I think there's work that we would have to do um, to even consider that, given that today it's the limit is six feet. Um, I think it's, and then two, I think it's a good practice that um, we communicate to neighbors if, if an adjacent homeowner is considering, or maybe they pull a permit to have an ADU. Now we can't require that, but that seems like a good practice to me um, that um, we, we would have that requirement. Um, and then the third, um, I think that we, we should encourage the owner who's building the ADU to connect with their neighbors. And so I know that that sounds like a, well, why wouldn't that happen? I don't know that that would always happen. Um, and I think that that would be uh, something that we could encourage, nothing that the city needs to manage, uh, but something that we could encourage. Um, and one of the benefits of that um, would be to ensure that those adjacent neighbors at least know who to contact at the city if they do have questions um, around um, an ADU being built. Um, so those would be three things I would suggest. And then um, there were two suggestions that came out of that the meeting that we had. And so I don't wanna take credit for either one of these. Um, one um, was that as we, we go through this process of, of, of ongoing process of um, doing our zoning audit, um, that we take this concept of, all right, let's, let's lean into how do we calibrate what an imposition may or might not be for a neighbor? Are there things that we can offer um, that a, a neighbor may take, um, take part in if they feel like they wanna mitigate a potential imposition. So that was, was one. And then the second, um, I would support moving forward with this, but then I'd also say that we should um, keep this on the work plan. Um, I'm a big proponent of let's look at the metrics, let's look at the data, Maybe we, you know, we do this for a year or two, we look at the data, we look at the metrics, and we can tweak um, as we go. Um, again, I, just, I think it would make a lot of sense for us to do that. Um, and then the last thing, I, I would just acknowledge um, the two of the neighbors I met with are present today, um, and so I appreciate them coming out um, to, to hear the discussion. Thank you, Member Pierce, Member Jackson, and Member Risser. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So again, I have to start out with a thank you to Commissioner Smith and, and to Mr. Lewis. Um, you guys have worked so hard on this um, and really very professionally done. So I had a chance to talk to one of the parents who came to us when we were considering the project at St. Peter's and the Able Light thing. And in that process, we learned there is a tremendous need in this community for adult children with special needs and housing. And I keep them in the front of my mind all the time because their stories, 
These are independent adults who aren't fully independent. And you know, as our parents age, they're independent adults who aren't fully independent. And these are populations that are right here, right now, in need. And if we can even, in a small way, address that, I'm super excited because it, the stories are heartrending of how difficult it is to find housing. Um, I went back and looked at Vision Edina, and on the very first page, the comments are that we want to have life cycle housing in our community. And I'm going to read from the third bullet point in the document. It says, we strive to promote a healthy demographic mix that builds on the tradition of multi-generational families. And I think that's what ADUs is all about. And you've done a nice job of pulling up our foundational documents, but I wanted to go back to that. You know, we had a comment this evening about the people who are here now. Are we making decisions for them? And this was a document that was a, had a big community-wide outreach. Our com comprehensive plan, I don't know how many hundreds of volunteers worked on that. We had a housing task force that went on for 18 months. We've had lots of public input. This is something that our community needs and I support. Um, the public hearing, I loved the call for the desire for generational housing um, and for that our city has adults um, or adult children and, and elderly people who have special housing needs um, who would love to live near their family member. Um, and it was also pointed out uh, about the thoughtful work by the Planning Commission. And I know everybody worked so hard on it, and Commissioner Smith in particular, but the whole commission worked on this for a very long time. Um, to your comment, Member Pierce, about um, keeping it on the work plan, I'm not sure that I agree with that, but I would like to have um, follow-up and, and metrics put into place where we see how this is being implemented if it is indeed um, uh, minimizing the need for variances, right? And that was one of the things that came up in the public hearing as well. And I love the fact that this was designed to minimize the need for variances. Um, but I would like to have periodic updates on, on how this is going and, and is it working according to plans. And I just have to say, when you sat down and walked through this with me, every question that we raised, you guys addressed. And you addressed it not only in your own minds, but by reaching out to people. And I love that. And the community engagement and the thought process is just really A-plus work. And so I am proud to support this ADU ordinance. Thank you, Member Jackson. Member Risser? I also would like to thank all the people who are involved in um, getting this to where it is, um, particularly um, Commissioner Smith. So, and I know you you have done a lot of work for a long period of time. I do want to say that I really think the points that um, Member Jackson is, or excuse me, Member Pierce is raising are so important. And um, it got me thinking, you know, in other parts of the world, maintaining privacy is something that is really valued, and it even hits at architectural design. And um, I'm going to read a section from this document that says, the more densely populated and busier a neighborhood, the more attention ought to be given to the matter of privacy. The following general suggestions could be considered. Reducing the existence of windows and apertures that face the outside world and trimming their sizes down resourcefully and artistically screening windows, positioning windows and apertures strategically and above the eye level, using opaque and semi-transparent glass parapets, employing blocks and slabs used as both screening and decorative elements. And I think, you know, how does one sort of weave this very um, diplomatic and um, important sort of approach to designing architecture and particularly what we're talking about ADUs. And you know, you could say, let's just ADUs, go forth, do it. Um, but you know, what if people were encouraged, don't put that balcony out facing your neighbor, put it into your property, you know, uh, really think about how it's going to be used, really think about where you're positioning somebody. And I felt badly with the discussion that happened on April 2nd. You know, there was a comparison that came up 
um, between garages and ADUs. And the reality is that the function is very different. And you've got people living in ADUs, um, potentially, you know, facing out onto other people's um, private space. And I, I have seen situations, actually, I have a friend who moved away from Edina after um, her house almost became totally encased by larger buildings that sprouted up around it, and there was going to be a patio that would just literally hover over her backyard, and she would have completely lost all of her privacy. So now she's in Bloomington. But, you know, moving forward in a way where we really encourage people to think about the impact of what they're doing on their neighbors, I think, merits consideration. And I don't know what the answer is in terms of what we're looking at tonight, but, you know, if there could be some kind of language that was built in, you know, make those windows smaller, you know, don't, don't do certain things um, that are facing outside of your property. Thank you. Thank you, Member Russer. Member Agnew. Thank you so much. Uh, and I also just want to echo my appreciation for all of the work that went into this. I, I think it was a really, really great effort. So thank you. And, and thank you to the rest of the Planning Commission as well. I know that they all provided input. Uh, I, I support this, and I support this as written um, today with the inclusion or the removal of the one line um, uh, based off of the Planning Commission's recommendation. Um, and I, I'm just going to tell like a little story to, to bring us back a little bit. Uh, but when I first moved to Edina um, in the Pamela Park neighborhood, my husband and I bought our um, like first house. We lived in a condo before, but it was a Rambler. And we'd only lived there for a couple of months when my mom needed a place to live. And she, I'm an only child, so it was kind of on me to do it. Um, and we were able to take her in, and that worked um, for a while. Um, but ultimately, I got pregnant, and we were starting our family and bringing kids home into our house and needed some additional space. Um, she isn't someone, though, she's legally blind, uh, who can live on her own safely. And we talked about it of like, oh, should we just like put something on top of our garage? And then we like looked into it and learned a little bit more about what was possible. And I just think <laughs> about it, speaking to the, the um, community comment that we had earlier, you know, people who are already residents of Edina today who could use and benefit from something like this. When you hear about all of the families who want to keep their children closer, um, when you hear about <laughs> member Pierce potentially wanting to bring his daughter back, like we're talking about families and we're talking about a lot of those situations and that it's not, not all of it, right? Like there are so many different applications and uses of this. Um, but when I think about the importance of opening up opportunities for housing, giving people more options, um, and really just making housing and different forms of housing more accessible, I think that that's just really advancing us as a community. So I, again, I appreciate all the work that you did into this, and I'm, I'm excited to hopefully see it move forward. Thank you, Member Regno. Um, I think I was probably the most reluctant traveler. But you did a good job visiting with me and explaining what the Planning Commission had worked on for, I think, well over a year. Uh, two. two years. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking I was falling short of the mark there. Um, but I've gotten comfortable with the notion over time. And, um, and I'm going to support it as well. I think Member Agnew said it well. And supported in its present context, but I think some important issues have been raised, particularly uh, Member Pierce at our last meeting, talking about impact on neighbors, uh, and that continues to be an issue, I think, for all of us. So as I think about what we did down in the Southdale District with developing those design experience guidelines to help developers think about how we'd, what we'd want to see in our town and how it ought to be, you know, maybe even if we, assuming we adopt the uh, ordinance as proposed by the Planning Commission, one element of ongoing work could be uh, a team that creates design elements to be developed for ADUs, because I think Member Rissa raised a good
good point. I mean, it was an obvious point. You, you, you know, put the balcony, if you're going to have one, if you've got an ADU above a garage, maybe you put it out hanging over the driveway and not hanging out over your neighbor's backyard uh, or off to the side into your own backyard. Um, so, and I, I continue to worry a little bit about, okay, you got your mother-in-law back there. You build a really nice uh, ADU for detached or above the garage, and she passes away, and then you got a significant amount of money invested. Maybe you sell the house and move on, and, and we provided that either the the owner either has to be in the ADU or the or the house. They can't rent be renting them both out. I think that was smart, um, but um, I continue to worry a little bit about our tighter neighborhoods where. Uh, if somebody decides, well, I'm going to rent out the ADU, we don't allow on-street parking. And I think, you know, somebody's going to rent, and then they're going to have trouble jockeying cars around in country clubs. Some of them even have shared driveways right now. And so I'm going to set that concern aside as we think about sort of the, the broader nature of this good um, on balance and, and proceed so that we have the ability to have people fix up their basement, put something on attached to the house or detached or above the garage. And I think those are all, uh, you've, you've studied it thoroughly, all of you on the Planning Commission. Thank you for that. And good to see you, incidentally, here recently at the social gathering of the United Give and Go, you and your wife. Um, so I'm going to support it as well. But I, I would encourage us to think about, and the Planning Commission to think about, Maybe taking some of these architects or getting some of these architects that are doing ADUs. I think you referred to a firm up in St. Louis Park that was doing ADUs. And, and look at some of these design elements that we might think about using as guidelines uh, or even in, incorporate into an ordinance uh, at some future time to make sure that we don't have the kinds of problems uh, that we uh, are a little bit worried about relative to affecting neighbors. Pierce. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, you know, I support the ordinance without changes, but I'm not clear, so I'm a little uncomfortable on on the way forward. And so what I'm getting at, and so I'll be really explicit. Two of the ideas that I talked about came from the Planning Commission, and so this was Chair Bennett saying. Um, this idea of imposition that maybe we should take that lens and as we go through the zoning audit process, that should be something that we start to look at. Um, so that didn't come from me. That came from Chair Bennett. Um, keeping ADUs on the work plan for the next, he said, couple years. And I think the intent was just to have a marker so that we're collecting the data and we're presenting the data if we need to tweak it, we tweak it, that kind of thing. Um, again, that came from Chair Bennett. And I agree with both of those things. Um, and it, what made me feel comfortable is that there would be a placeholder for someone to dig into some of these concepts to then figure out what changes um, may or may, may not need to make. It seems smart to me to do it that way. Um, and then the third one, the um, when I met with the neighbor, they actually suggested the screening. And so what I suggested two weeks ago was to have the owner do it. Well, they never said that. Their first point was, hey, if ADU goes up next door to me and I want to put up a privacy fence, can I do that? If I want to do an eight foot fence, can I do that? And today you could apply for a variance, but you would likely not get it. And so that to me is another, has nothing to do with the, I don't think with the ordinance, but those three things, it feels like we need to have a placeholder where that work will reside. Um, because I think they're really good they're really good additions to the workload to make this an even better use for our community 
than what we currently have. So I'm not sure how to do that, but I, I am not suggesting that we make changes to the mm -hmm. ordinance. No, I didn't expect it. I uh, yeah. suspect that you were, um, but I think it's it's something that you thought was important to continue to monitor it as, as these things get built now, and I don't think there'll be very many of them, but um, there's some continuing monitoring process that we look at some of these elements that we think are important Right. Or, or start in right away on looking at design elements to be developed. That and have those design elements be, I don't know, ADU guidelines or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. could be a they body of work. They don't have to work. be in, in the ordinance, but they can be guidelines. Yeah. That could be a when body of work. When they come in and meet Mr. Teague, you can tell them, no, yeah, we'd suggest these kinds of windows in your bathroom. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, anyway. So, um, I hear some unanimity, unanimity of opinion here. Uh, some guidance for the planning commission, commissioners, I think, you know, you've listened to this and it's echoing some of the thoughts you've had in terms of sort of ongoing monitoring as member Pierce says. So I think at this point in time, uh, the question would be uh, is before we get to a, a vote or a motion, uh, do we feel comfortable waiving second reading or do we want to just grant first reading and bring it back? I don't, I don't hear anybody suggesting some changes in the ordinance, so it's possible we could just waive, that, that a motion could include a waiver of second reading. Um, I, uh, if I could, Mr. Yes. Mayor. And so I just, again, wanna give credit to um, Mr. Lewis, Commissioner Smith, and Chair Bennett. I think I had a list of four or five things that I thought we should do and the hour and subsequent various emails we, we uh, walk through, I think they did a really good job of walking through some of those made sense, but then if you were to do them, they created a different imposition. And so I really felt um, that they did a really good job of thinking through how to structure this um, to one, reduce the proliferation and then as best as we could reduce some of the imposition um, based on the way that it's written. So I just wanted to give credit to them for that. All right, that thank work. you, thanks for that. Well, let me ask, is there a council member that would care to make a motion to approve ordinance number 2024-02 uh, relating to accessory dwelling units and uh, waive second reading of that ordinance? Could, could, I, could I interject and just ask you to state that um, if it's your intent to include the Planning Commission's recommendation to delete that provision about frost protection, if you so choose. Yes, that's, that's the, the maker of the motion says yes. Okay. Member Agnew. <laughs> and is there a second? Second. All right. We've got a motion and second. Uh, motion is stated along with the uh, recommendation from the Planning Commission. It's, it was on the screen. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption? Sorry, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> more discussion. Um, how how do we intend then? I just want to be clear about that. To the three things that I talked about, uh, two of which came from the planning commission. Um, does that work? Are we giving that? I'm looking at you. <laughs> To He's smiling as if and nodding his is, head is, affirmatively. I mean, is that working session or, and, and it's not something that needs to come back in the next couple of months, but I think it's really important that that work sits someplace and then we're able to come back. And I, you know, I'll just say this again, just the optics of us approving this ordinance and then acknowledging that there could be imposition to neighbors and we're gonna actually figure out if and how we might offer mitigation for that, that is, I mean, that is a good message for us to send to the community. And so I just wanna make sure how that work is gonna sit and we're gonna lean into it. Yeah, so <clears throat> we had our first meeting with the consultant in regards to the the zoning audit that's going on. So I think we can all add this to the list of things that we'll keep an eye on. It would probably result in the second phase after we've done the audit and made recommendations for how we think the code should be formatted. 
Um, <clears throat> the other thing I would do is just add to our current work plan, this is more in the working draft of our, our work plan, put it in the parking lot so we don't forget that we're gonna revisit this for the, or keep it on the work plan that we propose to you all next year. Thank you. We've got a motion and a second. We've had discussion on this uh, proposed uh, resolution adoption and waiver of second reading. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the uh, motion as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. All right, very good. Thank you for being here with us this evening. Thank you. And um, folks in the audience, thanks for being with us as well. And um, we will now move on to a commission correspondence. I don't think we've had any uh, correspondence come in while we've had the meeting here. We're going to move on to manager's comments now. I don't have any comments for tonight, sir. All right. Uh, let's go to uh, Member Risser. Thank you. And I do have images that are going to pop up in a moment for one of my comments, but I have a couple tonight. Um, it's important for people who are concerned about airplane noise and RNAV, which is the navigation system that we are moving to, um, to know that there are two meetings that have been scheduled. We have the time and the date. We do not have a place yet, but on Tuesday, August 13th at 1 p.m., there'll be one RNAV um, listening session. And on Thursday, August 15th at 6 p.m., there will be another. And so I don't know if- Both an Edina member, sir? Uh, this, this is not necessarily an Edina. Okay. The one that is an Edina is my next announcement. Right. Okay, so um, there is that. On, and that is coming up, thank you. Wednesday, April 24th at 6 p.m. here in City Hall in the community room, we will have our knock listening session. So noise oversight committee um, for the Metropolitan Airports Commission. And um, so those are my, my knock announcements. And then um, I have kind of a, a fun one that I really wanna bring up because um, we have so many people in Edina who care about art and public works. And um, what we are looking at right here is um, two people who are part of the Edina Woodcrafters and they are based in the community center and this is John Corbett and Jeff Tam and they worked on refinishing one of my favorite pieces of art that is located along the Edina Promenade called Timepiece. And this was one of the initial donations to the whole public works um, movement that happened in 2010. And I was really fortunate when I came on board here that I was able to walk the promenade with Lois Ring, who is a huge supporter of public art. And what you're looking at is the structure that that piece of wood, and they refinished it because, and Jennifer, I don't know, do we have a picture that shows it? Yes, okay, there we are. Uh, and what happened was over time, as you would imagine from 2010 when this was installed, and this is by Dean Holtzman, he was the artist, um, and Dee Kennedy is the uh, person in Edina who contributed this. Um, Tiffany Bushland, who is the Centennial Lakes general manager, was involved, Lois Ring, um, seems to have functioned as kind of the, the glue that brought everybody together and um, got this whole thing going. But with the help of uh, people working um, for the Parks Department, uh, the Community Center Wood Program, the Woodcrafters, and Lois, so many things happen. And so this beautiful work timepiece, um, which I think looks like sales and movement and all kinds of things. It's uh, Lois and I both really like the abstract art that is along the promenade. And so we were both very excited. And I have not gone out to see it since it has been refinished, but um, it was reinstalled, I believe back in December of 2023. And Scott Denfield created a wonderful video um, that you can watch on Agenda Edina, Public Art Restoration. And I think I have managed to mention every single person who I wanted to mention in this. But if you haven't had a chance to get out and look at this um, or walk the promenade, it is really amazing to see some of the works of art that we have there. So, um, 
and I believe, oh, the other, did we need to talk about scheduling a meeting for changing our review, or looking into using League of Minnesota Cities for our next annual review? Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and mention that. Uh, I, one of the things moving forward uh, with this annual review process that we, as city council members, need to do every year is kind of rethinking um, how we're going to approach it. And I do think it would make sense to look at the process that the League of Minnesota Cities uses. Um, and I also would like to encourage um, other council members, and I have not done this yet, but I will get it to you by Monday. Uh, Manager Neal did give us back in December a list of his 2024 goals. And uh, we were requested if we wanted to add to those to give feedback um, to that. And so I think it's important that we follow through on that. And I, my understanding is maybe there's a meeting in June where we could discuss this, um, if my memory is working from the work session. I think we'll have, uh, we'll have some time now to decide how we want to approach that review, that annual review. Okay. But certainly the we've used that league process in the past and it's it's probably been refined since we last used it and it would be good to talk about it again mm -hmm. all right good uh member jackson nothing for me tonight thanks all right thanks member pierce um thanks mr mayor i i had one thing that i had up and now i don't um so this is actually a follow-up that I will make with Member Jackson, but I just wanted to mention it. I got an email today from uh, Principal Bass at Valley View, um, and he would like to, to work with us. And the way I kind of read this is they would like to try to do a little bit of, of um, these are my words, education and the importance of polling and voting um, and so he sent kind of an idea where they've got some projects uh, they have some funding and he wants to do kind of a poll and have students vote uh, uh, on these projects and then I kind of said well it might be a good idea too to kind of tie into some of the um, democratic process and I don't know if that's education or what have you and then I mentioned that Member Jackson is the liaison uh, from the council. And so I, I thought this was a, a neat idea. Um, and I just got it today. And so I will wanted to just quick share that and then I'll, I'll send it to Member Jackson. That's it. All right, very good. Uh, Member Agnew. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I had a really fun time at the Udina Give and Go. Um, it was hosted, it was just what, Friday, uh, and it was amazing time, and I just, I love getting it together with members of the community, and I think in those spheres in particular, I felt like I ran into so many different commission members, um, and so it was just a really great event, and I, from what I've heard, it was really successful, so great to support, support that. I think that's all I had, though, for this week. Yeah, thanks for that observation. It's just what a great organization that, that was started about a decade ago to help uh, families and kids in our community that couldn't otherwise afford to do certain things. And boy, the people were really generous. And I, I, I didn't hear where the numbers settled on, but was it over 100,000 that they? I think it was over 200,000. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's really fantastic. Um, and all the, uh, yeah, most of you were there. <laughs> <laughs> that could be there. Uh, Anyway, so uh, last night uh, was uh, this, write, they have a writing contest every year through uh, Edina Reads, school districts involved, the uh, libraries involved, uh, Edina Community Foundations involved, and they give out uh, prose and poetry writing awards to kids from kindergarten through adulthood, actually high school, and then there's an adult category. And these little uh, kindergartners that have written something uh, and get up and, and read it, it, it was just fantastic. I hope next year we have a bigger crowd. They deserved a bigger crowd. Uh, so that was fun to participate in. Uh, and then this morning I also did uh, a city update for the realtors over at Coldwell Banker. So I thank them for inviting me over there. Uh, and then last week on the 10th, I was on a panel 
at the Minnesota Shopping Center Association monthly meeting with and see if it was Plymouth, us, Osseo, and Inver Grove. So a lot of different communities around the metro of different sizes that have different things going on from a, a retail standpoint and a shopping center standpoint. So that was, that was a nice experience. Um, on the 8th, we had the Regional Council Mayor's annual public safety meeting. We had Andy Luger there, uh, Bob Jacobson from the Department of Public Safety, Drew Evans from the BCA, uh, providing quite a bit of crime data. And so that was uh, helpful as well. Uh, and then um, Bill Neundorf and I happened to be at the 50th and France Business Association meeting on uh, April 5th, which was I think the day after our last, no, two days after, three days after our last city council meeting. Um, and I would just want to commend uh, Manager Neal and Bill Neundorf for being regular attendees at that 50th and France Business Association meeting. It's really helpful, I think, to have the city presence there as they go through this transition now with Re Rebecca uh, taking over the reins of the leadership down there. And it's, I think they'll, they'll do really well. Um, and then I think, yeah, I wrote down Days of Remembrance on the 16th of May. So that's it for me. A um, few things that uh, have been going on in the last couple of weeks and uh, there'll be things going on in the future. Yes, Member Jackson. So what did you learn about shopping centers in Minnesota? How's the health of them? You know, um, there's so much variability in terms of, like Osseo really doesn't have anything other than local merchants. So they don't really have a shopping center uh, as you know, that people are, might be going next door to one of those other larger communities. And nobody has retail like we have, uh, which is pretty fascinating. And Inver Grove, you know, they're, they're really positioned well uh, right south of St. Paul, which doesn't have much going on downtown anymore either. But they don't seem to be able to get the kind of traction that they want. So there were, there were interesting stories to be heard Plymouth has this whole med tech thing going. You know, they're they're just becoming a med tech hub. They got more med tech per capita there than anywhere in the United States. Yeah. And so they're really evolving as a community, but they still don't have a downtown. So the mayor of Plymouth was actually telling a story about they want to have a downtown. They want to have like an Arbor Lakes or a 50th in France. Uh, and so uh, they had this developer come and they were going to do it right uh, west of their new community center, their, their redone community center. So they brought this plan and, and uh, the mayor and the city council said, no, that's no good. And then they came back again and they had a couple more trees on the plan and they said, no, that's no good. And, and the mayor said in this meeting then with the shopping center association, he looked at him, he said, go down to Centennial Lakes and look at Centennial Lakes. That's what we want, something like Centennial Lakes. So that was uh, pretty cool. and. Uh, and then, of course, their retail is different too because it's um, they don't they don't have any they got some little strip malls there and then a lot of drive-throughs for food. But uh, nobody is set up to deal with retail like we are, and we become the retail hub of the of the metropolitan area, especially high-end retail, because there's nothing left in downtown Minneapolis, and it's 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 Edina. So if you're going to go shopping, you're going to go I think to Edina. And then uh, quite a few people had read the article in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago about. Simon's $400 million commitment to Southdale. And so uh, that was nice to be able to talk about too. So thanks for that question. All right, uh, anybody else have anything? That trigger anything? All right, is there a mo uh, We don't need to have a motion to adjourn. We can just adjourn. Stand adjourned. <laughs>